I want to let you guys know that we just had a limited edition drop on the website last week of new items that sweatshirt, flannel, t-shirts, shorts, basically the limited edition items are the items that directly support the Table Talk podcast. So if you go to EliteFTS.com backslash limited edition, or actually just the link in the description, you can find the limited edition items that we have now, which there's the one that I like the best is the shit suck good great, which is all emojis. The designs I always like the best, right? They're the ones that don't sell for shit, you know, but they're the ones that I want to wear that I like the best. And there's the, there's the cigar one as well. And they're all there on the screen for you guys to be able to see. So if you go to EliteFTS.com backslash limited edition, the other thing that directly helps support the podcast that I haven't talked that much about is the Table Talk crew. The Table Talk crew is extra edition episodes that go out once a month. The content of those episodes are AMA related, question related that come from the Table Talk Discord group, which is also part of being in the crew. When you're in the crew, there's dozens of ebooks that are in there. There's every seminar that we've ever done is put on there. There's courses that are put on there. There's series that have put on there. The original YouTube channel that we had for many years that we before we migrated to the newer one, all that old content is on there. There's discussion groups for just general training, fitness, life, nutrition, basically everything that you can think of is on. So just go look at what that is, or better than that, just go to the description, click on join the crew that helps directly support the podcast, which is how we're able to keep this thing rolling. Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate. We are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. What's going on, guys? We're back with another episode of Table Talk. Before we get started, a couple updates to the Join Your Crew ad that you just saw. We have two new giveaways that we're running on the Discord server right now. One of them is for the Zigzag Fat Bar, then we're giving away three of the new triple handle tricep pushdowns, straps. You know, we've had three different iterations of this strap. So this is the newer one that we just brought in a couple weeks ago that are on there. The other thing with the crew that we talked about a little bit last week is when you join the crew, you also become eligible to sign up for training retreats that we're gonna have out here at the gym. The first training retreat is August 26th and 27th, and we still got 15 spots left for that. That's just basically training barbecue. Bullshitting and ball busting is the best way I can kind of like wrap that whole thing up with what that is. Um, go to the description, click join the crew. It's one of the best ways to help support the podcast as well. The limited edition apparel in the ad has been updated. There's new apparel, which is on the site now. Head over to EliteFTS.com. Use the discount code TABLETALK. Save 10% off your first order. My guest today is Nathan Payton. And there's a lot of ways to go about explaining this. So I'm just going to, I don't want to, I can say straw man nutritionist, right? But that's kind of limiting because you work with a lot of other athletes and you've right. worked with people in a, kind of a medical setting as well, diabetes mm -hmm. and so forth mm -hmm. as well. So I'm gonna put it out there just for the interest of the people to say mm -hmm. that you've worked with, was it seven World's Strongest Man yes. competitors mm -hmm. and have had somebody in the World's Strongest Man finals for the past 15 years. Yes. And outside of that, you've also worked with professional athletes and so forth mm -hmm. and are currently the owner of Metroflex Gym in Houston, yes. correct? Yes, absolutely. All right. So. There's a lot of 
things I want to talk about <laughs> with this. So as I was going through your content, I kind of said real quick off air that I've summarized it as like nutritional periodization, which mm -hmm. you don't know what I'm talking about with that. It'll make more <laughs> sense as we're talking here. But how would you summarize your approach methodology to the nutritional side of the, the process, right? Because I, mm -hmm. I don't want to say strength and conditioning, but most of this is going to be geared towards that. Right. But I'm hesitant to say for training when there's also this could curtail into diabetes and so forth as mm -hmm. well, because a lot of what you do is with insulin modulation. Yes. And basically that really forms the foundation of everything that I do with my thought processes, be it from an athletic standpoint, um, overall health standpoint, just whatever that may be. It comes from basically the standpoint of how I view and work with my diabetic clients in that a diabetic, their system, what makes them diabetic does not work right. When you're taking someone who begins from a state of imperfection and you're able to refine that, I found over the years of working with the diabetic clients that I have that that enables me to better dial in and tune in for athletes and people with very physical, uh, various physical goals that they might have. So with that, a diabetic, their ability to process and to facilitate macros as they ingest them is off kilter. You know, insulin is the body's storage hormone. So when your body lacks the ability to store and utilize the nutrition that you bring in, we have a problem. With diabetics, it can be a fatal problem, obviously. Be it type 1, they're going to die if they cannot have that artificial means, you know, exogenous insulin. Or a type 2, which is later in life mainly due to insulin sensitivity that has gone off the rails. It is in that, the type 2 diabetic setting, where insulin sensitivity is what has taken the hit, if you will, and been greatly reduced. That technically tends to apply to all of us. None of us are factory issue anymore. When we were born, we were factory issue. We were new off the lot, just like when you go down and you buy your new truck. From the moment you drive it off the lot, life happens. The engineers at Ford didn't necessarily design that you were going to hit that pothole going 95 miles an hour. That's kind of where we're at with this. Our bodies, from the time we're born, we begin to hit potholes along the way. Our life encounters various either environmental stressors, so perhaps the way that we grow up, our nutrition that our parents introduce us to begins to take impact. As we begin to be later on in life, our own decision-making begins to have quite an impact. Our athletic and or professional pursuits, let's say you're a Wall Street banker, something like that, your stress levels are so high, that's having an influence on you as well. So none of us are factory issue anymore. We are um, not as the engineers designed. And because of that, I have found that if I view an individual and how they're going to process nutrition coming from a place of imperfection, I have a really uncanny knack of being able to dial them in kind of at an advanced level. And especially as it pertains, as I have found out through 20, 25 years, strength athletes, because you guys are constantly, my guys are constantly hitting potholes several times a week for hours on end, beating the shit out of the body. And because of that, the best laid plans for your diet don't necessarily line up with what you've just done to yourself that day or the next day or the cumulative impact of two weeks or the month or whatever block you're on. Let's let's peel back the um, the insulin discussion a little mm -hmm. bit because a lot of the meatheads that I'll hang around will hear that. And their, their brain goes two different ways, mm -hmm. right? First, the first way it goes is I don't want to take that shit, mm -hmm. you know, because that, that will be a later discussion later. Mm -hmm. You know, th that's the first one. Then the second role is they just tune out, right? Because it's like a hormones of discussion. They just don't want to know anything about it. So explain to, explain to me the role of insulin, how insulin works in the body as far as the nutritional standpoint as, as I'm a third year old. Mm -hmm. So when you eat your peanut butter sandwich, You've got carbohydrates, you have protein, and you have fat. 
Insulin is the storage hormone. When you ingest the food, it's like somebody rings the doorbell and insulin comes out to see who rang. It finds the macros that you have and it shuttles them off to where they should go. It's the body's storage transportation hormone. So carbohydrates go to become glycogen to be used for a training athlete. Protein goes to be utilized for tissue repair. And fats go to kind of hormone modulation and balance because our body synthesizes our own hormones, male or female, from, in many cases, the fats that we ingest. You know, it turns them off cholesterol, cholesterol becomes testosterone, things along those lines. So the foods that you eat are literally, you know, our parents would always say, you are what you eat. You know, that ridiculously simplified statement is a thousand percent correct. You are what you eat. It's like I tell people, I can open the, jo the door to any gym in the country, around the world, and I can see a sea of people in there working out. Jesus, there's only so many ways you can do a push-up. There's only yeah. so many ways you can do a bench press or a squat or a deadlift. Why do these sea of bodies all look different? It's because everybody eats different. Not only does everybody eat different, everybody receives that nutrition differently. Your sensitivity to insulin is going to govern how well you receive those macros for it to do its job. Your lack thereof is also going to influence your inability to progress in a manner that you might have predicted. Even with the best laid diet, oftentimes things can go awry because unknown to the coach, the individual is going through, you know, a divorce. And so they're incredibly stressed out. Um, or you're in the peak part of your block. And because you're in the peak part of your training cycle, you know, you're basically hitting 95 percent or wherever you need to be. Well, your cortisol levels are skyrocketing. Now we have good and evil. Insulin in my world being good, cortisol being bad. Well, cortisol opposes the actions of insulin. So now the insulin can't do the job that I intended your diet to do because of the way you're beating yourself in that yes. part of the training block. And so I kind of have to always stay a step ahead of countering that before you get there, countering that when you do get there. And getting those things timed so that you can receive the nutrition as you're supposed to through the insulin. Without conflating the, the macros, the protein, carbohydrates, fats, and I suppose alcohol, if you want to count that. But mm -hmm. the, let's say they're all independently in the system without the other nutrients. What's insulin's first role for each one of those separately? Because mm -hmm. it changes when you combine. Well, it's funny because that, I remember one of the first experiments I ever did with that uh, was with my good buddy, Ryan Bracewell, who's, we'll get into that. That's how I got into strongman in the first place. But I used to always tell him, hey, when you eat protein, only protein, I'm going to check your blood sugar levels. Yeah. And he was always like, why the hell are we doing that? I'm just having protein. Like, nothing, to, nothing to see here. I go, it's going to go up. <laughs> He goes, why is it going to go up? There's no blood sugar there. One blood sugar go up because your body is going to kidnap a nutrient that is intended for one purpose and turn it into either multiple purposes or solely one purpose, depending on how low you might be. So in that case, I would have him do amino acids, too. I'd have him take an amino acid product and have him test his blood sugar on that, too. And he was stunned at how high his blood sugar levels would rise solely off having an amino acid product. So in that, you have basically at the stripped-down essence protein, bare bones, amino acids. Yeah. Well, we as humans have erased the middleman from the equation. The design, the factory intent from the engineer, if you will, like with the new truck, it was designed that we go from step A to step B, to step C, and so on and so forth. So you ingest your food, which is supposed to lead to this, which is supposed to lead to this to this. When you're cutting out all the middlemen and you're only having, let's say, protein, let's say that's not even the amino acid product, when you're only having protein, the body's going to break down that protein, but then it's also going to see, well, what else is needed here? You know, brain function, lung function, two big hogs of glucose as far as from an energy need are the lungs and the brain. So if the body is not operating efficiently on those from having been beat down through life and you're no longer very sensitive to the acts of things, then the body has to go ahead and kidnap where things are needed. So if your energy needs are not being met and all you've ingested is protein, rather than that being partitioned off and utilized to repair tissue from, let's say, your hard training, it's going to take half of that maybe and kidnap that off to an energy resource. So you're really only getting maybe half the bang for the buck that you intended off that nutrient. 
So that's why when you put other components with that, like you add a carbohydrate to protein or you add a fat to a protein, you're basically adding protective elements. Like in my world, I call it a protective bubble around that protein in order it can do what I intended the design of that to do because the carbohydrates are going to distract away from kidnapping and breaking down that protein for an energy source. The fats are going to distract and kidnap from breaking down that protein as an energy source. So the protein can actually be greater utilized for tissue repair, bigger, stronger, faster. Which was the reason I'm throwing some of those out there is because, you know, some of the more basic questions like how many grams of protein mm -hmm. that somebody going to need is mm -hmm. going to be dependent upon well, how many carbs are going to be in there. If mm -hmm. there's zero carbs, then your protein is going to have to be utilized for energy. Right. You know, so that changes. Or if there's a huge surplus and all the other stuff, mm -hmm. the protein requirements may be way lower than what a lot of athletes actually think they're supposed to be. Correct. <laughs> and, and that is obviously, especially when you're dealing with larger let's say strength athletes or NFL players, just larger athletes in general, their protein needs are often not what they think they are because most, you know, and we're not talking about bodybuilders prepping, going into Olympia yeah. or something. We're talking about individuals trying to get bigger, stronger, faster. Mm -hmm. With those individuals, a surplus is important. But like you said, the design and the makeup of that surplus is everything. And so putting our protein in a protective bubble and letting it, the carbs and the fats do both their design, and that's where timing is so critical. But doing that is where, yeah, I mean, you might have a 250-pound lifter who maybe needs 150, 200 grams of protein a day. He doesn't need 400 because he's got all these other nutrients that he's able to efficiently utilize that protein so much greater. And most importantly, for strength athletes, he's able to maximize his available fuel resource with the carbohydrates and the fats by specifically utilizing the timing of those macros for either tissue repair, fats, or tissue fuel, which would be your carbohydrates. It's like I'm backwards. Like everybody's always heard from the bodybuilding world, you know, have, have your protein and carbohydrates after your workout. And in my entire life, I never agreed with that or understood because what, what am I doing that for? I, I, I don't need to eat like spaghetti to go to bed. Like I'm just going to be laying there, you know, or... You know, if you've got the wife and it's a good night, well, yeah, maybe you need some of that resource from the spaghetti. But other than that, you don't need fuel and energy for that evening. You needed the fuel to max that training session. You know, so my carbohydrate intake with all my guys, the majority, and it could be somebody who's cutting, it could be somebody who's bulking, whatever the case may be. They're going to be fueling up to maximize that training session. And then from the time that training session is over, I'm flipping the switch and the priority is solely recovery by the time you're back out there for the next training session. I like, I like the protective bubble is the analogy for that because it's, I've, I've struggled with finding different ways to explain this to people, especially, you know, older teens that are just mm -hmm. eating a ton of shit to begin with, right? So they're just, they're in a huge calorie surplus and they're mm -hmm. all concerned because they read somewhere that they need 400 grams of protein. It's like, oh my God, no. And, um, but something that you just said, you know, hit a light bulb in my head because it's, I've lived in these coexisting worlds my whole life, you know, some of the bodybuilding side and the strength power side and the strength power side, strength and conditioning power side, nutrition was always looked at energy first, protein second from the bodybuilding side. It always seemed to be looked at as protein first, mm -hmm. energy second. Mm -hmm. And that always confused me because they all have to train, you know, where I think the, the perception comes from in one one world the performance you know the activity mm -hmm. is vital right it's it is if they're going to place first or last if, if they can get in the actual number of training sessions to be able to and the other one's just to elicit growth but i mm -hmm. think when you peel it and you look at it all it's still the same right and it, and it's like i like to and i'll tell me i've got IFBB pro bodybuilders who are good friends of mine. And I always crack them up because I always refer to everything as your world is show. My world is go. We got show and go. We got show muscles. We got go muscles. Yeah. And I mean, if, if you've ever been around a 300 pound bodybuilder, when they're walking around, like from the parking lot to the inside of the mall. Okay. Yeah. Can we go home now? Yeah. Well, it's still go muscle, I've, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I got, I got 460 pound yeah. athletes yeah. who can run around with a 1300 pound yoke on their back and then get ready yeah. for the next event. Yeah, we got we got show, we got go. Yeah. 
Well, they want to go home. Yes. So, 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 so they still want to go. <laughs> yes. Just a different place. With um, Before we get too far into this, how did you get into working with Strawman in a condensed version? That's Ryan. So Ryan okay. Bracewell, a good friend of mine. I moved to Houston in 2001, and uh, one of the earlier individuals that I met was Ryan Bracewell, and Ryan owns a nutrition store in where I'm from, Kingwood, Texas. And in that, he also opened a gym. So Ryan was pursuing this, this sport called Strongman, which I thankfully was familiar with because of my dad. And How so? Uh, my dad and I, we would watch World's Strongest Man. You know, it was on every Christmas. I mean, that's yeah. I, you mentioned World's Strongest Man to people, and they go, oh, that thing that, that we sit mm -hmm. around, and it's in between football games, and we flip through and see the guys with the big rocks at Christmas yeah. time. And, uh, you know, my dad was basically like my first— when you're a boy, especially, like you, you, you're always searching for something to identify with or something that's uh, real. And, you know, my dad owned his own transmission mechanics shop, and that's what he did every day. No air conditioning, no heat. You know, I'm from Missouri, so it'd be 20 degrees and he'd be underneath the car dripping snow on himself, working nine hours a day, pulling a transmission out. Same thing in the summer times. And, and my dad, even fr from a young age, I was just in awe. I mean, he had this big old pipes, just huge biceps. And my dad never worked out a day in his life. He did hard manual labor every day of his life. Um, and he would just pull transmissions out of cars, pick them up, walk them across his shop, throw them on the table and go to town on them and then put it back. And I, he was 200, you know, but you're talking the late seventies or eighties. These are, these are big cars and big mm -hmm. transmissions, you know, 200, 300 pounds or whatever. And it was just like nothing. And so when I saw how strong my dad was, you know, I identified and hoped one day that would be me. Will I be big and strong like my dad? Um, and we would always watch World's Strongest Man together. And he would always remark, you know, about how, you know, look at these men. You know, it's just amazing what they're able to do. And something my dad said always kind of struck with me, too, because he his biggest thing was he was fascinated how they were men from all around the world that maybe had differences in countries and philosophies, but they could all come together with the commonality of strength and compete against each other yeah. and support each other. And that always was something that he took note in. And so it was something that I took note in and, and him being kind of my first strength here, if you will. And so with World Strongest Man, me being very familiar with it from having grown up with it my whole life and, and watching it, when Ryan, who was the first individual I'd ever met in real person, who was like, I do this. And he was like, yeah, and I own this gym down the street here, whatever, besides this uh, store. And he was like, come check it out. And, and so I did. And we, you know, became friends. And his wife, Amanda, you know, she used to work out at the gym next door to their store. And I had met her a couple of times. And, and uh, we all just kind of became friends. And, and I was fortunate enough to be... Uh, partner in on the gym as well as our friendship grew and in that he was pursuing strongman going for his pro card he and everything was in the gym atlas stones i mean you name it yokes mm -hmm. logs everything and in that um that's about 2008 2009 and uh, in that his training partner on the weekends for even more of the specialized implements and or to just continue to be pushed by those in the sport above him, like Marshall White and Travis Ortmeyer. Well, Travis Ortmeyer, who you've had on, mm -hmm. Travis was the big one as far as Ryan would go to his location and train with Travis. And Ra Travis took note in, Ryan, what's going on here? Like, I used to be able to bury you in this, and this particular event, and this particular event, you're, you're catching up. Mm -hmm. What's going on here? And Ryan kind of shared with Travis that he was working with me and, and Travis, you know, being hyper competitive, he always wants to know, well, if there's something going on, I need to know about it. So Travis came up to the gym and introduced himself through Ryan. And uh, one thing led to another. And in the condensed version, it ends up being, you know, I prepped Travis for World Strongest Man in 2009 and a couple of shows prior to his tune-ups. And that career and the 15 year streak of clients competing at world's strongest man. And in the finals, it all starts right then and there 2009 with Travis and Ryan eventually going on and winning his pro card as well. And his friend, Alan Colley also who would come down and train from Florida became a client of mine. He wanted to win a pro card. He won his pro card. And, 
and Travis being very, very vocal uh, to any individuals that he would meet, even his dad, you know, Roger, you know, began using me as well, Papa Stones, and pursuing his thing. He was an incredible master strongman. And it's just all those components work together with, but it, it still comes out, and I kid him every day. I'm like, I'm going to bring your name up. It, it literally comes down to Ryan and him having this, I don't know where or why, but this trust or belief in me from our conversations that I had something to offer in the nutrition world that might make him better in his pursuit of that pro card. And that in turn has led to everything. It's, it's so interesting to hear uh, stories like that because to add a little bit more to your story, that goes on to you help Travis get leaner, cut weight, mm -hmm. grab the attention of Brian Shaw, then you get Brian Shaw and it kind of goes Slid into my DMs. Where all the, yeah, all the aspiring <laughs> coaches today are trying to find how they can get Brian Shaw, how they can get the pro guys. And it really makes you wonder, because every story that I've heard like yours didn't start there. You know, it started with just some guy, you know, that needed a little bit of help. You knew something that they didn't know, kind of a meeting of the minds, kind of put it together, start building the process there. And then that person leads to all these other ones where I think there's, I mean, it's, I don't want to go down this big coaching rabbit hole, but it leads to this big misconception that everybody's trying to chase this invisible rabbit that they think's out there, but that's not what everybody else did. Right. You know, everybody else just took what was presented in front of them like, oh, this could be interesting. Right. Like, wonder what can happen here. It could have went completely sideways. Terrible. Could have, I, <laughs> I could have absolutely crippled Brian. And that could have been the end of the career and yeah. he took up bowling. Yeah. So when that first diet, well, it's, it's, not, it's not even a diet really. It's more like a consulting, mentoring conversations. What did that look like then? Um, kind of the same way that I do it now, even though it's obviously highly refined after, after all yeah. these years, um, because, and I think one of the strong suits is that I'm not married to one ideology on anything because I just don't think that's realistic. Um, I might have the ideal ideology in my head for what approach I would use for you, but see, I don't know your lifestyle. I don't have to live your life. I don't have to walk a day in your shoes. And so my ideology might be absolutely perfect for you in everything that you've told me in your questionnaire with, you know, health history, what your training schedule is like, what your current lifts are, where you're trying to go with those lifts, your body weight, you know, anything, supplementation, wherever we may be. I still don't have to walk a day in your shoes. Yeah. So so that's where the program and, you know, wise old Al or however you want to look at it, but where experience comes into play and that I am quick to have my basic core system, which is what I will design for people, which is heavily predicated off the information that they give me on a day in their life, um, which I think is very different from what a lot of nutrition, especially coaches do. Everybody is so focused on, you know, your body type, your current stats, what your training and everything is. And I think that everybody really misses the most obvious, which is the thing right in front of us. And that that is okay, great, but what's this person's lifestyle like? And that lifestyle, I had better be prepared for it to change because your lifestyle might be what it is today, and I line everything up to match your training and everything like that. You might meet a girl three months from now. Now your lifestyle is a little bit yeah. different. Maybe you're not sleeping as much as you used to, or maybe um, your training time of day changes up on me, or maybe kids enter the equation, and maybe you go from five days a week to four days a week. But even at that doesn't tell the whole story because you're cooking for children now or you have a wife who uh, maybe she's a vegetarian and I've got you eating all these meats. I need to be prepared to flux, to flex basically, and make a diet work to your lifestyle first. What, what led to, I mean, because we're going back to 2008 with that and that's a very experienced thought process mm -hmm. for coaching and training just in general. What created that thought process kind of before it even starts? So what were you doing before that mm -hmm. to be, because you, you, what you're telling me right now, somebody coming straight into that wouldn't be the typical thought process 99.9% mm -hmm. .9 of people would mm -hmm. have unless they are bringing it from someplace else. Um, I, I brought it in from, I used to be with a very, very, very large 
company uh, called LA Weight Loss. And it was a wonderful company. And I was a very young, um, I, mean, I was I 26, yeah. 27 years old. And I, you know, basically by the time it was all said and done, I was over, you know, franchise operations for the entire southern part of the United States, you know, yeah. very large numbers. And, but doing other things as well with the company, as far as like looking at our diet approaches and, and marketing things like that and having a, having a welcome say, if you will. But, you know, I, you know, I went to college just like anybody else, but no, no that, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, you don't need to laugh. That makes sense mm -hmm. because it's <clears throat> dabbled in some of those industries mm -hmm. right out of college. And you, mm -hmm. you learn really, really fast yes. that because you're dealing with gen pop and it's exactly what you just said. Mm -hmm. Right. So then when you, that now it clicks. Now I get it, right? Where if all you dealt with were those high-end athletes, then you create a bias in a mm. box where you can't have that bias in the box with Gen Pop because, oh my God, you know, this one's a, an attorney that does have no free time. This is, you know, somebody with all the free time in the world, you know, and stay-at-home mom with no kids, you know, basically all the free time in the world, Absolutely. something like that. Or... <clears throat> And you realize, at least I did, I realized real fast, like, oh, shit, you know, I'm trying to stick this in a template that doesn't exist. Well, and, and a lot of it came because of, you know, being so young and in that type of a role. But that company was owned by Harold Katz and Harold Katz owned, was, had been the owner of the Philadelphia 76ers. And I'm 26, 27 years old in this, like I said, a pretty high up role in this company. And. We would constantly once a month have to fly up there at minimum for corporate meetings and stuff like that. And and Harold's hands on. So I'm literally with a billionaire who's valuing my input and who wants to hear the say of our group, you know, all of us that took part in that role, if you will. And, you know, going to Christmas parties at his house in Philadelphia with the uh, half basketball stadium in the backyard. And because the players would come and practice yeah. at that, just incredible things at such a young age. And I remember one day Harold came up to me. We had a conference at Caesars Palace. We would have an annual conference every year, and, and we would speak. And I, I remember I had like a mini seminar, if you will, that I had to give for our franchise group of owners. And uh, Harold had entrusted me to be an individual who did that. And, he, and one of the things he said is he goes, you got, I want you to remember, you're about to speak to a bunch of very wealthy individuals who are over a bunch of very not wealthy individuals. He goes, you need to, in 10 minutes, reach everybody, and I'm, I'm banking on you to do it. And I guess the talk went well, whatever, <laughs> however that went. But afterwards, Harold was like, he said something to me, and again, 26, 27, he was like, he was like, kid, he goes, I don't know what it is. He goes, but I guarantee you, he goes, you stick with me. He goes, you'll go places. Now, when you're that young and you have a billionaire who you work for and who likes the things that you're doing, and he had assembled an amazing team, you know, the, the people that were above me, everybody's just an amazing group that worked there at that very, very large company at the time. And the company ended up going through changes and transitions and had to, to disperse, if you will, or do different things. Um, but when you're that impressionable and that young and you have somebody who's breaking it down, who's a billionaire, who's entrusting you to be part of the team that he's assembled that is an asset to him, if you will. But you got 10 minutes. Speak to people that are very well. Speak to people that have a lot. Speak to people that have little, but get it done. Mm -hmm. I, I carried that over into the diet and nutrition thing because it's the same thing. I've got to speak to those genetically who have gifts and those genetically who do not. Yes. I've got to speak to those who have the financial means to have access to a lot of equipment or access to the best foods and those who have to build it or make it themselves and get by a McDonald's. I have to make it work in whatever lifestyle, whatever demographic I have, because I can't have the bias of, well, this is how I like to do a diet, do this. It's useless. Yeah. It's the most worthless thing. It's got to be make it you and now yes. make it you. You don't have time. Well, it's, it's tough to scale though, right? Because it's a lot of, I hate sometimes when I got to choose my words very, very, very precisely, you know, in the nutrition industry side of the online world, there's, there's a lot of people that are able to work with a shit ton of people, mm -hmm. you know, so many people that I question, how exactly does this happen? 
Mm -hmm. right? And the only way it can really happen is just the plug and play template and all that, which in no way can do what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Because as we'll discuss moving forward, not only can it change in, you know, a couple week period of time, like you were saying, it's they can travel, go end up in a different place, compete in a different place. Um, stress changes daily. I mean, there's a lot of metrics that change all the time that play in the same way it would training is going to play into this. This is kind of where the periodization came in because, you know, I, I heard you discussing that there will be, you, you will, the nutrition is going to melt, bend, not bend, integrate in with whatever their training is at the time. So if it's more endurance based, the training is going to have to reflect that based upon what energy sources and the insulin modulation compared to if it's more of a, a very high strength, low strength endurance phase, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it has, and that makes sense to me, you know, like that has to be there. The same way it makes sense to me that you need to have the nutrients before the training to actually do the training. I get the after the training, I, I get that, but I don't, I never understood not having the energy to fully maximize and I'm coming from a powerlifting side, you know, that power that, cause it's a fucking every session's valuable, yes, right? Exactly. There's, you don't have one to throw away. Yeah. There's not, you can't just like fuck it up and not have a good one. Right. It's gotta, you almost gotta peak the nutrition for each one of those sessions. And now you have clients in different countries as well. So the access to food is going to change there too. Mm -hmm. um, fucking language. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things. Right. And so if we're to break this down into what, <clears throat> where do you start, right? So you have the strength athlete, okay? And we'll just go strength athlete, um, straw man. So we have the endurance standpoint to make it a little bit more complicated mm -hmm. instead of just the Let's define that first, right? Because I don't want people all pissed off. I, <laughs> but it changes the nutritional needs, correct? Mm -hmm. If it between, tell me the difference between the powerlifting's and nutritional needs and a strong man's nutritional needs, generally. Mm -hmm. Heavy physical stressor in motion, heavy physical stressor not in motion. <laughs> Okay, that was good. That, that was about as fucking basic as you could go. <laughs> so that to me, at the, at the bare bones, is exactly what we have. Yeah, I like that. You know, so I have to be able to basically facilitate and fuel a muscle for either umpteen number of repetitions or one big ass repetition. Yeah. And that's, that's really the main difference between the two because one is highly muscular endurance based. One is highly strength-based, really. I mean, you're trying to pop off one good one, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, that's what you want. Be it the world record, the national record, be it your own PR. When you go to meet, you're trying to pop off that one good one, squat bench dead. Yes. Well, same thing when you go to strongman. But my guys are trying to pop off one good one for the log for eight because it's max reps. And the guy before him might get seven, so they've got to be able to hit eight. Or the guy... You know, so there's all these variables in play. So you're taking an athlete with a lot of the same ways that I would approach my power lifter, but I'm fueling them differently because I know that the glycogen usage is not going to be on par. And this is, where, this is where I've pissed off my power lifter clients and friends, but I I'll beat them down a lot because I'll tell them, I assure you, you did not exhaust glycogen out of your muscles like you think you did today hitting your 531. Mm -hmm. I, you're good. <laughs> We're going to be able to top that back off and you're going to be able to get back out there. So here, I'm going to go ahead and focus on recovery. Whereas my guy who's doing, you know, with, with strongman or whatever, and they're doing the deadlifts or something, if it's a max rep, max rep deadlifts, you know, it's 800 pounds for reps and they've, you know, they've got to get eight, nine, 10. That's an entirely different animal right there because you better believe glycogen is being depleted. And in fact, that reminds me slightly off topic, but on topic. Uh, Arnold Classic 2020 up the road here in, in Ohio. The year they, they debuted the Wheel of Pain, that gargantuan freaking thing from the Arnold movie. So Martins was in that. Martins Lisi is my client. We won 2019 World Strongest Man, and we won the Rogue. We won the Arnold in 2020. So all these things. But on that, you know, I was checking his blood sugar, as I will do on occasion with the guys, and kind of make sure that we're topped off. So 
in an environment of a contest, I will check their glucose levels because I have going into that contest check. So I kind of know when their own individual unique gas tank is full. Your gas tank is different than mine. Mine is different than Tom Stoltman, so on and so forth. So knowing what their full meter is. So in this case, I'll use Martins' example. When Martins' glucose levels are about 145, that's his high end. So I will keep topping them off between events. Um, and keep in mind, there's all these other things that happen the day of, the night prior, and all this stuff. But during the contest, I'm continuously topping them off because I'm looking for that sweet spot because I've already predetermined his top end is about 145. So if we're getting ready to go into the next event and I check him and let's say he's at 110, well, I know he's not topped off. Topping off is important because it, it's my safety valve. It's my, oh, shit, what next? Because they never know, you know, a lot of these things, they're going full bore like that. How fast and hard can I, how many repetitions around can I turn this thing? But when they go out there, they don't know what that actual distance is going to be. They just know they're going to go until basically failure. So with something like that, let's say that I hadn't been aware of what that parameter was with Martins. And, and I, you know, we ate whatever we ate the night before that I specifically will target. I had to meet whatever I have a meet that morning. But then as the day goes on, we're six, seven hours past breakfast, blah, blah, blah. Had I not known what his level is, I wouldn't have known that when Martins went round and round and round on that thing and he won the event, climbed on top of it, and there's all these awesome photos and stuff from that event. When he that event was over and he basically passed out, he was still awake, passed out and they th on the floor, they threw the oxygen mask on him. He was fully fine. Literally, as he's down there with the oxygen mask on him, I'm, I'm pricking his finger because I'm curious. <laughs> my own mm. fascination. I want to see what his blood sugar level is. So when I checked him, this is right after that event, he was 47. So he was, I had topped him off prior to. So before he went out there, I had made sure that he was at his sweet spot, which is 145. And he went out there. So again, he won that event. Imagine what happened, how that athlete's performance is compromised if his glycogen stores aren't fully topped off so that he has that, oh shit, sitting there ready to tap into when the wheels start to come off the bus. Out of curiosity, did you test him again five, 10 minutes later to see what it, if it just oxygen restored some of that? Yeah, yeah, literally while I was laying down there, I also gave him yeah. a Rice Krispie treat. That's yeah, yeah, the yeah. shit I ended up being known for. Out of everything in life, yeah. I'm the fucking Rice Krispie guy. Yeah. But, but literally he ingested that and he quickly comes up, because again, I know how fast my guys will come yeah. up or go down on stuff. And, <clears throat> and he quickly bounced back up and he was just in disbelief. He goes, that is nuts. He goes, I can't believe it pulled out that much of my glycogen. He goes, where'd it go? You know, Martins is awesome. He, mm -hmm. he, he doesn't want to know from a scientist standpoint, he just wants to know where to go. Did it evaporate? Mm -hmm. Where the fuck did it go? Floating. And and I told him, I said, dude, when you're doing something like that, you're exhausting such large muscle groups, your th your quads, your hamstrings, your chest, every his arms. I mean, everything is going on that grind. It is whole body. So the contractions are so much from those large muscle groups that circulating blood glucose, instead of being circulating through his bloodstream, it's being pulled into those large muscle groups like the pump. Mm -hmm. You know, he's literally pumping. It's a pump channel as he's pushing that around. So he basically pumped everything into his muscles so that it wasn't necessarily available in that circulating, like I can think clear kind of a standpoint to be utilized for energy. That's where people drop the ball a lot. They'll fuel up to be able to have a max contraction event or be able to get their strength, but they don't account for you still have to have circulating glucose available for your brain and for your, for your lungs to be able to go to their next level during that same event, your muscles are going to theirs. So blood glucose is circulating. And the minute I start to do stuff, I'm opening channels, telling it to go somewhere. So you're doing the pump. That pump is from the glucose being shuttled in. You still have to have circulating enough glucose in order to not compromise your performance. And so that's why kind of knowing and measuring and figuring out where your sweet spot is so that you're compensating not only for the event, lift, whatever it is you're about to do, but also to fuel it. Because otherwise, you peter out. So the circulating glucose, let's say it was 100, and it's pulled into his muscle group during that event. Now what? It's all his pump is compromised. His pump and his performance has just compromised the fuel aspect of things. The strength was there for the muscular contractions. But the fuel, the energy to keep going and going and going, 
that had to be accounted for, which we did by the hair of our chinny chin chin. Any less, and, and he you know has a compromised performance, maybe doesn't even get a full turnaround. Wouldn't that have to start months prior, though? Oh, yes. You know, as far as laying that foundation, because yes. the reason I want to go here is people are going to hear that and think this is what they need to do day of, but if they can do that and it's a blank slate, you're going to fuck it all up. A hundred percent. So yeah. many times people will come to me. The most common question that people will email me is, hey, I have a contest coming up. What should I do the day of? Yeah. And I cringe. You know, it's it's like, to me, it's like I've, you know, a swim meet showed up and I decide, hey, I'm going to jump in the water tomorrow. What fucking stroke do I do? Like, mm -hmm. do I do freestyle, butterfly? Like, I don't know what to do. And it's that same thing. Like some freaking unicorn sandwich is going to drop out of the sky for you to eat the day of your competition. And this magical thing is going to occur yeah. that has never occurred to you at any point during your training block. Yes. That's the part that drives me nuts. It's like with my clients, same thing with the lifestyle. And as we're going along through the training block, what I do besides just the core diet is I target trainings. So you might tell me, okay, this week's agenda is I'm going for max on deadlift. I'm going to go real heavy on log, but it's going to be basically based on reps. And, uh, and I might go ahead and do a full event day on Saturday. So I take that information in and then I go, okay, so I got two agendas that I have to accomplish. I have to not beat the shit out of your insulin sensitivity from Monday to Sunday because I still have to keep you sensitive because I'm going to target those specific trainings that you identified as your main focus for the week. I'm going to target those and I will build the cheat meals. So a surplus around when you're doing those, because I am literally not just trying to give you extra fuel for those events. Yes, I am. But that's, that's the little picture. I'm conditioning you for what's going to happen 12 weeks from now when you're competing and when I put the peak week in process, I'm conditioning your body to hyper respond to the stimulus of those additional macros. So that's the thing that people really don't understand is that you have to condition the body all along the way to hyper respond. Whether you're losing weight, gaining weight, strength goal, whatever it may be, at the end of the day, dieting is a skill. It, it is a skill. It has to be acquired. It has to be learned. And just like in here, it is learned through repetition. You know, you, you get better on squat because you identify cues. You get better at dieting because you identify cues. You identify when you go into this workout, if you felt uh, like the energy wasn't quite there by the time you hit the max rep, you go into this um, cardio session that you might have as part of your week, since we were talking about strongman. You know, you identify that, God, you gassed halfway through. You're able to identify that information as it comes to you because of the cues that you have gotten used to identifying from being consistent in the skill that you have learned. And that's the biggest thing that I try to, to, to teach people is that dieting is a skill, it is a skill set. It is learned solely through repetition, just like anything else. And a client this morning actually had emailed me uh, with their check-in and they had noticed that he's in the heaviest part of his block, a uh, power lifter. And, and Logan was like, Hey, I'm at this part where uh, I've noticed that my appetite is starting to come down and he's hitting 90%. That type of thing is he's getting ready here in about three, four weeks. And I had told him, I said, that's excellent. Dina. And he's extremely strict because he's good at practicing his skill of dieting, he's able to notice those differences that most people wouldn't. If an individual is not strict on their diet and they have all these fluctuations, it's no different than coming in here. And, you know, well, your program calls for this, but ah, today I'm going to kind of veer off and do this. Or it says stop here. God, but I'm feeling good today. I think I can hit that. I want to go up more. If, if you throw in all these things and remove the skill set, which is basically the parameters and structure of consistency, you can't pick up on cues. And I, in my opinion, I don't think there's anything more important to being able to take a body somewhere it doesn't want to go, you know, than being able to learn and pick up on those types of cues through developing the skill of dieting. So that in Logan's case, it's basically when he starts... When clients start identifying things like that to me, 
the first thing I pick up on is, okay, your central nervous system is getting crushed. That's his CNS that is absolutely starting to get fatigued and is getting yeah. crushed because of where you guys are in the block. And when that happens, the first thing that starts to take a hit is the appetite. Most people don't really understand why that happens. They just think I'm getting bored and tired of eating the same shit all the time. Even though my diets, I think have a lot of variety, but anyhow, um, the, the what happens, though, is that when your central nervous system gets the shit beat out of it, your cortisol levels are just skyrocketing. Well, everybody knows that. Stress. Physical stress, mental stress, cortisol levels are high. Problem is, good and evil. Insulin good, cortisol bad. You know, as far as opposing, cortisol opposes the actions of insulin. So you are finding your appetite getting crushed because your insulin sensitivity is getting crushed because of the influence of cortisol on your insulin sensitivity. It's reducing it. So you are no longer efficiently handling the macros as you were, say, last week or two weeks ago. So when that type of a thing happens, I have to be able to quickly flex and, and make him understand, okay, here's where you are, and here's where we're going to kind of do a little bit of a reset to get, your cent to get your central nervous system to calm down as best I can while you're still bludgeoning it. <laughs> All right, so if I'm understanding what you're saying is, given that scenario a loss of appetite, right? Mm -hmm. So there's the metric, you know, down. Mm -hmm. If somebody's just winging the diet, right? Some days they eat a lot, some days they don't, just like the normal person. Mm -hmm. That loss of appetite could be a result of numerous different things mm -hmm. because nothing's really being controlled to be able to know what it could be. I could say sleep could be an example too, like what are the hours of sleep? Mm -hmm. The more metrics that you have that you can keep some kind of control of mm -hmm. will allow you to, help determine exactly why that is what it is because it could just be they're not eating enough but they don't know but if they're on point you know if they're eating enough right. because they're eating plan right? right yeah they're they're picking up on their cues that they're able to identify from the structure and the consistency and you know the sleep metrics like you talk about yeah. there's all these different things that kind of come into play and have that influence you know other things like that so let's say that that logan identifies that uh, you know, my, my appetite is starting to take a hit. I'm getting it in, but it's definitely more of a task than it was previously the week or two. My sleep is starting to be shit. You know, when you see things like that, those are all, you know, at the end of the day, if you're a nutritionist, you're kind of like a glorified food detective mm -hmm. because you're trying to identify and solve the puzzle. What's going on here? Can I fix this? And a lot of it is unspoken. A lot of it is the client. You can't expect the client to know. The client, that's that's not their role. It's like me knowing brain surgery. Yeah. You know, that the brain surgeon knows. So I can talk about I have a headache here or vision changes or whatever. Those are cues to him that lets him know this or that, maybe what's going on. Let's go deeper under the hood and have a look. And that's what my guys do for me when they're giving me that type of a feedback. And when you know it, that it's a client who is who is consistent and is constantly putting those types of cues at work for the benefit because they're practicing their skill. Of dieting so if if a, if a somebody dialing somebody into a show if their metrics are going to be um images you know compulsory poses once a week scale weight um maybe body fat but normally it's just that so those are the metrics with the strongman and the strength athletes what are the metrics that you're using to decide if you're going to be able to pivot so the insulin sensitivity is that um, glucose levels, like morning glucose levels? It, it's a lot of both. So it's it's glucose levels or because of the way I design my diets, I have a lot of control on the expectations that I know what the diet in these combinations will produce number-wise in a healthy individual, if you will, not somebody with some sort of impairment going on at will. The diets, and it's like we, we're going back to kind of like the, the insulin and how to, how to steer these types of things. Another thing that uh, a lot of people really miss is your combinations of your macros are equally as important as the macros themselves. And not just the protein being able to its own bubble, but it's the influence of those other macros on each other and the, the form that they're in. So with that and talking about the insulin, stuff like that. If I have you eat a steak and a potato, beef and a potato, and I check your blood sugar level, I'm going to get a level. If I have you eat ground beef and mashed potatoes, 
beef, potato, same amounts, let's say nine ounces and 10 ounces. I'm going to have a completely different mm -hmm. response. Same exact macros, same exact, same exact everything. But you're going to have a far different insulin response to that because the form and the combination of those macros at that meal. So here we go back to that middleman, if you will. So when you have something that's mashed, I mean, I could say smoothies. I really hate smoothie thing. <laughs> just digestive. I just really right? hate the smoothie <laughs> thing. But, it, it, you know, in a way, you know, mashed potatoes are a potato smoothie. Yeah. Um, you are taking the middleman out. The body doesn't have to really digest that. So you're skipping a step. Because the initial breakdown of the large molecule is gone because now we're in a small molecule. You know, mashed potatoes are already almost in a paste. So the body can absorb it and get at it quicker. That is advantageous during certain timings of certain things. Pre-workout, a quick fuel source that can get at you that you can utilize prior to, like, let's say, an intense day. That's optimum compared to, say, a slower carbohydrate situation for a day like that, that maybe isn't really going to truly saturate your system until you're about done. So it's, it's the identifying the different macros, their forms, and the combinations of that will also bear significant influence on that meal, the blood sugar levels, and what kind of transpires from there. And so having to relay that to your clients as you're kind of toggling conditioning them moving forward towards that peak for that contest. So oftentimes my clients, you know, we might be on potatoes at some point as an example, as an allowed carb choice, the way I call it. As we get closer in, I might start switching off to some of those more easy burn things like mashed potatoes, mashed sweet potatoes, you know, of course, rice is a quick one. Um, because I'm trying to condition them for the peak that's coming up so that you're, I'm targeting them along the way with their specific workouts and getting their body used to ooh, accurately addressing this influx of larger macros, but also at being able to efficiently assimilate those macros in a, in a little bit of a quicker time frame. Because once we start hitting peak week, you know, like bodybuilders call it the same thing, once we start hitting peak week for like my strength guys, I start putting in a little bit more junk because at the end of the day, you can eat clean, but if you eat how you always do, your results are going to be what they always are. Not, like I said, that unicorn is not going to drop out of the sky when you're having the exact same foods that you always eat on the day of the contest or the week of the contest. If you have several, like, strong man, you know, world strongest man, that's all week long. But you need to have a different stimulus than what you would normally have, but you have to condition the body along the way to efficiently deal with that stimulus through those food combinations. Um as an example, just on the different things that can go on with those food combinations, like with my diabetics. So I'll have physicians from Scotland or God, where else? Ireland. Uh, you know, they'll send me patients that they're having an issue with that they just can't, uh, you know, they just can't get into, into play. And they're like, oh, I'm sure they're just eating like crap or whatever. And it's like, well, they might be, you know. But at the same time, it could be just simple things that they're not understanding. And unfortunately... Like with Ryan, when I was talking about testing him for the protein and the amino acids, and they're still eliciting a glucose response. You could ask 99 diabetics, hey, you get to pick one of these two things. One slice of cheese pizza, two handfuls of gummy bears. Which one of these two things is going to mess your blood sugar up worse? They're all going to say, oh, it's gummy bears, that's sugar. They're wrong. It's going to be that pizza. You've got carbohydrate, you've got fats from the cheese, you know, of course. And you've got protein, but because you've got a high rate of carbohydrate and fats together, those fats extend out the duration of action of that glucose that's circulating the system. So that blood sugar level rises higher and higher and higher because it's in the system longer. And when you take an individual who's already having trouble clearing it out, which is what diabetics do, the sensitivity is reduced so they don't absorb or utilize, that blood sugar level will always tend to rise higher. Than if they just ate the gummy bears, which was just sugar, and that's it, though. So the gummy bears would spike it's and then just it's come in back in and down. it's out. And they don't truly release an accurate insulin yeah. response. They either have an inefficient one or they have none if they're a type one. But what if they ate butter with it? Same thing. And you can, if you pair up, and that's where those food. No, no, wait, same thing as it's going to spike or is it's going to make it. It's going to be like longer. the pizza and it's going to last longer. Yeah, yes, yeah, okay. Because you're, you're, your packaging, and now you've taken, let's say, the protein, which was in that protective bubble, 
in that in type of individ in that type of an individual who has an impaired situation, you've basically put that that carbohydrate yeah. in a protective bubble because the fat is now the thing that's protecting and allowing those levels to raise, 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 which is inefficient. The glucose is not entering the stream and so entering your cells. And so that's where you end up in those same type of situations with athletes. You're trying to condition them to when that slice of pizza comes in, it's sucked in and it's utilized. But it's like anything else. It's conditioning. It's, you know, it doesn't matter if it's an enhanced individual, a natural individual, if it's a power lifter, if it's a strong man, if it's bodybuilding, if it's uh, you know, Johnny Hawkins from the band, nothing more. He's my client. He's super crazy ripped and he runs around all night for two hours in an arena, you know, crazy show. You know, he's ripped and lean as hell. But every single one of those individuals has to be addressed in different manners because of I have to condition them along the way for how they're going to utilize those nutrients in their own unique lifestyle and their bubble. Johnny's on a bus, You're on a tour bus. You know, he's got to have yeah. his access is his refrigerated cooler, you know, a little mini fridge, you know. So he has a restricted thing until it's catering and then backstage at catering. He has, there's some governance that he can put on catering when they're the headliner, a lot of governance. When they're a support act, they don't have any governance. So lifestyle, making the diet that's going to make that individual as successful as they can be within their lifestyle. A physician might look at the diet and be like, well, that's, that's not a great diet. What, that's, what are they going to do there? Like, where's just the chicken and rice? Okay, well, see, the way their lifestyle is. You know, it's like if I found like a went to a yard sale and found some unreleased Beatles album, yeah. you know, and nobody's ever heard it. And I find it, but I don't have a record player to hear it. What good does it do me to have all that? So that's kind of the same thing. You can have these really elaborate, crazy dialed in every medical parameter known to man in play, every testing going on every 30 days. But it doesn't reflect the lifestyle because I don't have the player. I don't have the thing to play play that yeah. diet on so i've always thought of the fats as you know outside of what fats do you know is, is a way to slow the burn mm -hmm. you know so if it was you know mm -hmm. a higher glycemic index and i could spread it out over a longer mm -hmm. period of time um which i never thought if it was high high foods mm -hmm. it would spread the high high out over a long period mm -hmm. of time i mean my warped mind i was probably thinking it was neutralizing it you know, to a certain degree to spread it out. But I'd also put, say, the fats in with the whey, you know, to spread that out. Mm -hmm. Whereas if somebody would, in my brain, say, take case and that burns slower, I'm like, I can just take fucking whey with almonds, you know? And, and then how much difference, you know, is that really going to make with how that spreads out? Where when you're dealing with insulin sensitivity with, forget the whey and the protein, because it's a little different mm -hmm. as far as, but still it impacts that to a degree. That that changes that conversation differently mm -hmm. because it's at a higher level where that's gonna spike for a longer period of time. Right. Which you may or may not want. <laughs> and that's the key. Yeah. It may be an asset yeah. or it may be a detriment. And by targeting those individuals, specific training sessions, conditioning them along the way, to kind of better assimilate that larger influx of macros to have that type of a response, it can be an asset, it can be a detriment. Because, again, you can either use it to accentuate the fuel or you can use it to accentuate recovery, especially fats post-training and in the evening. You know, it would be hard-pressed for somebody to convince me that, like, lifestyle allowable, that if an individual has the financial means has the resource, has the time means, has everything under their control, and they could literally dictate every single night, I'm going to have a steak when I go to bed. And they are an active athlete, a good cut of steak, tenderloin, yeah. a tomahawk, whatever you want. You'd be hard pressed to convince me that there's anything out there that could possibly be better from a recovery and a, and a, and an, I, I don't want to use the word anabol, anabolism in that because if you're an enhanced athlete, the, the, the damn anabolic effect of the foods, it just doesn't matter too much. You've got that covered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but with, but for just in general though, because that steak, there's, there's the slow tear down, breakdown process overnight while you're sleeping. What happens while you're sleeping? That's your body's, when your body's doing the repair work in the first place, it is like the ultimate pairing in the ultimate world. If the lifestyle and all the stars align and you can do that. 
But as a coach, I have to be aware that that's just not realistic for most people. And that includes the top athletes in the world. That's not realistic for many of my guys. And so I have to know, well, what's the next, what's the next weapon in my arsenal that I can put in here? Or how can I assimilate that on a budget? How can I, you know, it's, it's got to be all these things that you can put together. I have clients in Dubai and I use camel tenderloin because that's something that they readily have access to. And it's, it is an asset for me to be able to utilize within their diets in that type of contract. Well, as we spoke earlier, it's constantly changing because you can have, <clears throat> you can have an athlete that you bring on that may not have the greatest financial means from the jump, but then over a period of time, they do, but the reason they do is because now they have all these other added responsibilities mm -hmm. that they have to do, which sucks up a lot more of their time. Well, and, and Brian, of course, is a yes. great example of that. Yeah. You know, in 2011, when I first started working with Brian, before we won the first title, that version of Brian, that's a way different version of Brian than the version of Brian that exists now. You know, strictly from... Well, not even strictly. I would say from a financial means, obviously, but from an equipment accessibility standpoint, from uh, everything. Yeah. But not he has these benefits financially yeah. and equipment wise. But guess what he also has? He has expanded family roles that he didn't have in 2011. So as one thing shifts and turns into another dynamic in the lifestyle that is a, of a huge asset, he has other responsibilities and things that then have to be accommodated for along with those assets. So he's still got to be able to merge all these worlds at once. And, and so here we are again with diet and lifestyle yeah. and, and where it's that like, goes. It's like, I've always explained that as kind of like Odin's big fuck you to the, to the, the meathead world. Like when you start, you don't have access to shit, you know, then once you get older, it's like now you got access to everything mm -hmm. best gym best draw you have access to all this shit but you're fucked because now you only got two years left <laughs> <laughs> you know it's like yeah. why couldn't i have this shit mm -hmm. from the beginning right you know and well and that's like the thing like what would you do if you could go back and tell your high school you like some things and tips yeah. what would you do differently or yeah. what would you with the resources you have now or the information you have now, how would that be different? Is Find that, a way to have shit. the resources yeah, earlier. Exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Without responsibility, which is <laughs> fucking impossible, right. right? To be able to go that route. Um, let's take a bathroom break real quick. Then when I come back, I want to get into um, like, where would you start, right? So if somebody hires you, then here's the base. Like, what is the base? Because you have to pivot from mm -hmm. there and then we'll go on from there. Let's take a break real quick. Okay. I want to let you guys know that we just had a limited edition drop on the website last week of new items that sweatshirt, flannel, t-shirts, shorts, basically the limited edition items are the items that directly support the Table Talk podcast. So if you go to EliteFTS.com backslash limited edition, or actually just the link in the description, you can find the limited edition items that we have now, which there's the one that I like the best is the shit suck good great, which is all emojis. The designs I always like the best, right? They're the ones that don't sell for shit, you know, but they're the ones that I want to wear that I like the best. And there's the, there's the cigar one as well. And they're all there on the screen for you guys to be able to see. So if you go to EliteFTS.com backslash limited edition. The other thing that directly helps support the podcast that I haven't talked that much about is the Table Talk crew. The Table Talk crew is extra edition episodes that go out once a month. The content of those episodes are AMA related question related that come from the table talk discord group which is also part of being in the crew when you're in the crew there's dozens of ebooks that are in there there's every seminar that we've ever done is put on there there's courses that are put on there there's series that have put on there the original youtube channel that we had for many years that we before we migrated to the newer one all that old content is on there there's discussion groups for just general training, fitness, life, nutrition,
basically everything that you can think of is on. So just go look at what that is, or better than that, just go to the description, click on join the crew that helps directly support the podcast, which is how we're able to keep this thing rolling. Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate, and we are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. I want to let you guys know that we just had a limited edition drop on the website last week of new items that sweatshirt, flannel, t-shirts, shorts, basically are the limited edition items are the items that directly support the Table Talk podcast. So if you go to EliteFTS.com backslash limited edition, or actually just the link in the description, you can find the limited edition items that we have now, which there's the one that I like the best is the shit suck good great, which is all emojis. The designs I always like the best, right? They're the ones that don't sell for shit, you know, but they're the ones that I want to wear that I like the best. And there's the, there's the cigar one as well. And they're all there on the screen for you guys to be able to see. So if you go to EliteFTS.com backslash limited edition, the other thing that directly helps support the podcast that I haven't talked that much about is the Table Talk crew. The Table Talk crew is extra edition episodes that go out once a month. The content of those episodes are AMA related question related that come from the table talk discord group which is also part of being in the crew when you're in the crew there's dozens of ebooks that are in there there's every seminar that we've ever done is put on there there's courses that are put on there there's series that have put on there the original youtube channel that we had for many years that we before we migrated to the newer one all that old content is on there there's discussion groups for just general training, fitness, life, nutrition, basically everything that you can think of is on. So just, or better than that, just go to the description, click on join the crew that helps directly support the podcast, yep. which is how we're able to keep this thing rolling. Okay, we're back. <clears throat> what I wanna do is if, if I'm gonna help somebody with their training, and might be a, you know, this would be a good way to explain it. And they're, they're coming out here. Um, before I even say anything, I'm just going to like watch what they do to see if they're even interested in any help, right? I'm not going to give any unsolicited help or anything like that. But to make a long story short, that would be a vetting process where you have a questionnaire, stuff like that. So I have the vetting process of before I'm going to do anything with that. And then if, I'm going to start working with them. And the first thing I'll start helping them with is pretty much just the warm up part of the training. They care, do this, this, and this. And a lot of that is to see if they're compliant, but it's also to help build their core strength because it's things most people won't do. Glute right. ham raises, pull down abs, hanging leg raises, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So there's a purpose behind that where it's the very basic level to start. So I can start to see how are they gonna recover this is kind of not that hard. It's very minimal. Like, is I going to get sore? Are they going to recover? Mm -hmm. And so that would be a base. And then the base will extend into like a little bit bigger base. And then once they get to a certain point, then it becomes, this is that moving thing that is like an equalizer that you're going to start playing yes. the switches with, right? Yes. So <laughs> that's, we've been kind of talking about that, right? Mm -hmm. Getting them to that base, what would that look like? For the major, for more than average, mm -hmm. right? Uh, picking my words because everybody's so different, right? right? So more, because it'd be easy to say five meals, right? But some people may not be able to do that, right? Right. So, 
a solid base that you would start from before you can start controlling the dials to that the listeners could use as a takeaway, but it also is gonna provide the right knobs mm -hmm. to be able to play with down the line. Mm -hmm. When, whenever I first start with someone, one of the first things that I take a look at, again, we go back to lifestyle, is one of the questions on there is like, basically give me an example of a typical day in your life. Like, I, I literally want to know, like, do they go to the library for two hours? You know, do they take the kids to the pool? Like, I want to know a typical day in the life. I want to know a typical time you wake up. I want to know a typical time that you go to bed. Um, I want to know, do you have issues with, you know, either making food or having food available with your particular job, career, like we've got surgeons and stuff like that. Obviously, if they're getting jumped into a surgery, you know, they can't freaking, their, mm -hmm. their time is quite limited. So I need to know all these types of things so that I can design the core of my diet, which is my core diet that is allows me to know what's going on with you from my window. So I design a diet, not necessarily because it's the very best diet that's ever existed and there's no other diet that can possibly be better than this diet. I'm, des I'm first designing this diet with these items that I have selected because I feel I can personally best manipulate either by removing or adding to these core items. So I'm not trying to knock your socks off with like overcomplicating the diet for you. I'm trying to make it to where it can slide right in and it's going to drop into your lifestyle. And like you said, it might be five meals. It might be three meals. It might be six meals, whatever you have time for. And that is realistic within your life is what I'm going to do. I'm going to design items. I'm going to design the diet to have items that either require cooking or don't require cooking items that, uh, it can be store-bought, items that can't be store-bought, items that you can roll through a drive through items that you can't. Because do I think that a protein shake at the, at the end of the day, if we're just going to go, I guess, apples and apples, is a protein shake superior or even equal to a steak? No, absolutely not. But what, what category is that steak sold in the grocery store? It's in the meat section. It's in the food section. What category is that protein powder sold at in the grocery store? It's in the supplement section. What's that word mean, supplement? It means basically optional, not mandatory, not required. You might use it if it's a supplement to something or to take the place of. So six of one, half dozen of the other. This is still better than this. However, for the guy whose lifestyle does not allow him, my surgeon, his lifestyle does not allow him to do that. That protein shake is absolutely a good viable source mm -hmm. because guess what? It is better than nothing that I can guarantee. Yes. So it's kind of going along those things. Like I said, my diets, I'm never like that type of individual. It's like, it's, it's this way, the highway it's, it's got to be first and foremost within your lifestyle to where my diet, you can drop it in and plug and play and go not have to disrupt, well, fuck, now I got to somehow make time to cook this here, prep this there. Uh, I'm going to have to have the wife cover this so that I can get to that. You're going to fail. I'm, I, as your coach, am setting you up for failure on your money. That's fucked. Like, I, I'm not in the business to steal from yeah. people. I'm in the business to make you successful, you know? And so it's my job to drop it into your lifestyle to give you the best, most realistic chance you have at being successful with your life. You shouldn't be penalized because you work a, a nine to nine job and have two kids at home and a wife and you have to move people around and take care of the house and you've got a sick mom that you check on three days a week. You should have every opportunity to be as successful as that individual who just all he has to worry about really is training because he owns a business. Yeah. So it's my job as a coach to do that for you. And so it's building all these different items that you can either just grab and go, that you can drop into your diet. If I need to design it to be three meals a day, I can design it to be three meals a day. Is that optimum? No, it's not. But I des you deserve me to give you the opportunity to try to better yourself from point A to point B based on your lifestyle. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it my all and I'm gonna make three work for you. It's not, science is gonna show. 
five or six meals a day is going to be better. But it's not better to you because you'll yeah. never be able to access it. So it's going to be dropped into your lifestyle, plug and play, so that you can literally hit the ground running. You know, I, I've had individuals who have even told me, like, I'm so busy, I'm here and there. And, you know, they're obviously not on a cut diet. They'll be like, I, I can't even get to the meat. I don't even have time to cook the meat. Dude, roll through McDonald's and get 10 hamburger patties. Take it home. Pull them out of the Tupperware two and three at a time as you need them. You're done. 30-second reheats. Like, where there's a will, there's a way. Well, okay, well, I made the food, but the problem is I don't have any, I don't eat this cold food. Who the fuck's going to eat cold salmon? Well, okay, man, I get you. I'm right there with you. But let's take that Tupperware and that gas station that you pass by on the way to work that's got the microwave next to the, the hot dog spinner and the nachos. Slide your fish in that for a minute there. You're good to go. Where there's a will, there's a way. But it's my job to give you every opportunity to be successful irregardless of your lifestyle and irregardless of your responsibilities and commitments. I feel too many times there's diets out there where people think they either need to A, be be wealthy. And some people will say, well, you got to be wealthy to afford me. But <laughs> that it's, it's not the same thing what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the necessary supplies, the necessary ingredients. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's got too many times people look at that and they won't even start. They won't even try because they're like, I, I can't afford that. People look at like Tom Stoltman's diet or, or Brian's diet. You know, he's, he's got the blessing of Trifecta, this amazing company to, to handle the meal prep. And it, it handles a lot of the financial resources, which Brian could handle anyway. But people think that I can't I can't be the next Brian Shaw or I can't be the next Tom Stoltman or, or, or Rob Kearney or I mean, all these guys, because I can't I can't afford that. I can't do that. So I'm just not going to try. But see, they, what they forget there is all those guys were those guys before they could afford to be those guys. And that's social media, right? Everybody always sees the best of the best and the latest. And the oh, well, they still had to figure out, right. you know, right. how to how to do it. Absolutely. Where the, I think the biggest takeaway on what you said is, you know, a lot of things that you'll see will I just use that you need to eat every two and a half hours, every yeah. three hours, something like that. The, the, and then that will push people away to say, well, I can't do this because right. I can't eat every two and a half, right. three hours. Or fuck it, you just eat every two hours each more, you know, whatever it's going to be. There's, there's a, there's an answer and a solution yes. that's inherently built into there, but it may change what those foods and what those meals are going to look like. Mm -hmm. So if I, if we just do like a basic recovery day, not a training day, so we won't mm -hmm. throw in any pre or peri workouts or anything like that on a basic training day, if it's, you know, a meal plan for somebody that, I hate to say only has the time because they, they also have more time than they think, which yes, is another caveat. hundred percent true. You know, so, but thinks they only have the time, you know, for two meals per day and you're dealing with the insulin sensitivity and the blood sugar that you're dealing with there. And you got big gaps in between. How are you going to control that? When you have those big gaps, that's where your supplement section comes yeah. in play. And that's where your protein powders, your amino acids, thank God we, we it's, it's, things are entirely different 10 years ago than they are even now. I mean, you can't get gas at the gas station without having protein ready to drinks in yeah. the gas station literally everywhere that you go. So it's having that mindset that I'm in a bind, I'm in a rush, it's, it, I'm not going to be able to eat for another three hours if I don't eat right now, and grabbing that and putting a, putting a bubble around that RTD with, okay, I'm grabbing this, but now what? I've got the protein, but yeah, damn good and well, about half of that is probably going to get kidnapped and won't actually go to the tissue things we want beneficially. Well, then it's like, what else that gas station got? 90% of them have oranges, apples, bananas at the checkout counter. A lot of them also have Rice Krispie Treat bars for a dollar yeah. in there in that section. You have all kinds of things. You have granola. You have granola bars. Those granola, Honey Valley Nature... Nature Valley honey, whatever the hell I'm trying to say, in the green packs. It's just a plain old honey and oat flavor. It's granola. It's cheap, you know, 25 carbs or whatever in a pack. You know, is that great? Is there like freaking probably genetically engineered stuff in there? Hell, I don't know. Don't sue me, Nestle or whoever makes yeah. it. But at the end of the day, is it better than nothing? Yes. Does it keep you moving forward to your goals far more so than flat out skipping that meal? Oh, yes. I'm 100% more so. Anything that could give me a hundred percent improvement over the the other choice is a win for me. So I can either get worse and skip this meal for three or four hours because I'm I can, don't have access to something, 
or I can suck down that RTD in a protein shake or a protein shake real quick, either with an apple and orange or rice crispy treat, the Honey Valley granola oat bars, which I build in on my diet, those granola bars and stuff for those reasons. Everybody needs a safety net. Nobody should be like, ah, oh, crap. My wife has a flat tire. Yeah. I got a meal coming up. Diet's over. Forget the contest. No. Look on there. What can you grab and go? And that's why where their lifestyle, the information, the things that they share with me enable them to make those decisions. Oh, cool. Crip. There's a, there, I'll grab the RTD when I'm on the way to take the can of gas tour and the tire changing iron, you know, and I grab the granola bar, the rice crispy treat, whatever the case may be, but you're on, you're on par. You've got your protein. That's always going to be <laughs> yeah. numero uno. If you're an active training athlete is making sure that you're facilitating tissue growth and repair, but you protect that bubble, throw something with it. Like I said, that's a good, healthy choice. Throwing something with it isn't a bag of Cheez-Its or a bag of Doritos. You know, it's a healthier, easy carb choice that is a mimetic for something that has much healthier option. A bowl of oatmeal is a very healthy option, if you will, ideally, that you could choose on a diet. But if you don't have the time or you're caught because of your wife's situation like that with a flat tire, grab the bar of granolas. It's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And it's far better than the alternative, which is nothing during that gap. You have to be a big picture person to keep your sanity with a diet. If you try to be like Alcoholics Anonymous and go one meal at a time, you'll drive yourself nuts. Mm -hmm. You're going to obsess over the next meal that's coming, the next meal that's coming, the next meal. Oh, shit, I missed this one's fucked. Now I got this one. And I sure as hell can't screw this one up or just screw it. Today's done. I'll pick it up tomorrow. Or these two days, I'll pick it up next week. You've got to have that big picture mentality of, let's say that you eat four meals a day, seven days in a week, 20, you know, you got 28 opportunities to get better in that week. 28 opportunities to, to keep yourself moving forward towards your goals. Let's say life happens to you seven times on those meals. And you got to make that instead of, you know, your steak and potato, you had to do the RTD and the granola bars. Okay, 21 of those meals were perfect and exactly as system designed. The other seven still kept you going in the right direction. Compared to if you flat out skipped those seven meals, you literally were putting the brakes on yeah. your progress. Or worse, if you're grabbing the Doritos or whatever, you're undoing that forward progress. So it's always having those available lifestyle choices that you can grab and go, you know, that yes, you know, it's like diet soda. You know, people always go, oh, shit, diet sodas, chemicals, you're going to die. Really? Says the people eating the nachos bel grande with their lap and the, I mean, really? Yeah. I assure you. Same people taking two grams of yeah. shit a week. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, that's what we're going to focus mm. on. Yeah, yeah. That chemical. Okay. Yeah, it's, I've always been one that <laughs> I, I can go extended periods of time with, without eating. That's always kind of been my my. Mm -hmm nemesis with that it, it serves me well as i get older right because it's easier to to try to keep my weight down it's like okay look it's just i, I have a very, and benefits like autophagy and all these things that, yeah. that are real but it's what i've always found was if i was gaining or putting and sometimes and we'll talk about the sometimes gaining is a motherfucker sometimes it's worse than losing for me it's, it's way worse than losing because of things you're talking about yes. but i could always bookend a day it's like i am guaranteed you know, the protein at the end of the day before I go to bed and when I fucking wake up pretty easy. Yes. If I can't do those two, then I'm just fucking lazy. Yes. I can get up 15 minutes earlier to make fucking oatmeal. You're 100%. It's, it's not that. 100%. It's minute oatmeal. It's yes. not a big deal. You know? <laughs> and yes. You mix it. It's, and same thing. So now it's like, okay, cool. Where do I fit in? two more meals in this whole 12 hours I'm awake mm -hmm. or 14 or whatever it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times for me, it's more habit than it is anything else. So if it's really bad, usually it's a stretch. If I'm being completely, I'd be like a stretch between whenever I eat this morning, like 1030 and I'll probably eat like at nine tonight. Right. So if I was really concerned about it, mm -hmm. then sometime around four, if it needs to be, I'll eat half a fucking protein. I'll just take a bite of something, mm -hmm. right? Because the reason why I go so long is I get in the habit of working and doing other things that I break the habit mm -hmm. of taking the time for that meal. So if I just stop and fucking take one bite of a protein bar, then more than likely I'm going to eat the whole bar. Right. right? But at least it's the bar. It's the start. 
Now, the smart me would always have the bar. So then I always have, not a, I always had the meal there to build on, where I think where people fuck up is they don't have the anchor, you know, so they say they eliminate that bar out of that middle of the day, in my case, anchor's gone. Mm -hmm. So then that habit now gets replaced with all the other stuff. Right. Then it's a motherfucker to start it again, it. where if you just keep the bar. Right. Then it's like, oh, okay. But, but let me ask you, yeah. is that not the same with, with guys in a training block? Same thing. So they start skipping here, skipping that, you know, it's hot Gotta today or up. a bad day at work. Boy, they get out of that pattern of, of feeling that weight on their back. You mm -hmm. know, as well as I do. Game over. Yep. It is so much that familiarization, that pattern, and, and just the training of yourself to feel, you know, the things that need to be felt to get from A to B. Just showing up. Mm -hmm. You know, it's even with surgeries and shit that I've had, I'll come in, granted, the gym is in my office, but, you know, I'll come in the gym and just grab a bar, you know, if, if I'm limping or, you know, post-surgery or whatever, and, and because I'm, I'm afraid. If I go, like, I love this shit, but don't test me. Like take it away for three months. I, you know, a lot of shit can change in three months. Right. You know, then all of a sudden, maybe I'm just smoking cigars on a beach somewhere and never fucking coming back. <laughs> yeah, <That's> true, <laughs> you, you, habits change. Yes. You know, so I think people <clears throat> miss that aspect of, of just they make it too hard. Like, just what's the simplest thing to be able to branch off of? And um, then the other thing is that we touched on a little bit, but we should probably go back to it. Is they will look at you know, the videos that Brian has and these other people have, uh, their meal preps, you know, the 30 minute video of the eight different meals. And it's like, mm -hmm. holy fuck, you know, I can't eat that. You know, mm -hmm. I can't afford that. And where you almost wish they, and Brian did. So I, I'd be interesting to go back. You almost wish they would have made those way back mm -hmm. when the meal prep was ground beef. And, you know, mm -hmm. They're, they're, they probably do. Some of them probably mm -hmm. do, you know, because there's ways to do it. Absolutely. You know, and that that misconception falls in there like, well, I can't do that. And mm -hmm. you can. Right. No, absolutely. And and it, it becomes it becomes a defeatist attitude because it, it I think we as human beings are so much all or nothing. I, th I think I th maybe back in the day, maybe through evolution over these last 40 years, not, not that a human can evolve in 40 years, but the mindset, the dynamic, there's been such a shift of all or nothing where people are either all in or they're all out or it's the very best of like, you know, you know, like every time I turn around, there's there's new cups that are like, uh, you know, eighty dollars and it's this brand this month is eighty dollars and it's the cool one to have. And then six months later, well, now it's this one. It keeps your hot drinks also as cold for 14 hours or something. Now it's the cool one. It's eighty. But then they don't they no longer want the one from four months ago that did the same thing, but maybe an hour less on the heat. It's like it, it, it can't it doesn't need to be all or nothing like there needs to be that understanding that at the end of the day, it's that self accountability and that self value that you place upon yourself to how important are your goals. For, so for that lifter who who wants to start a diet and who's got a competition coming. Um, and, and maybe it's an advanced lifter. I mean, I, I have so many conversations with God, pro athletes around the world from, I mean, every sport <laughs> and it's and when I'm talking to them and when I'm engaging in conversation, I can quickly pick up on how important is this really to them? Mm -hmm. You know, the, how much of this is the concept of, and how much is of this is a must have a must do and and it's that must have must do that seems to be lacking because as long as diet for an individual is still viewed as something that's optional maybe they get to it maybe they don't maybe they do it right maybe they don't that that will never go anywhere that they'll be able to achieve and take their body they're going to be able to use whatever genetic gifts they already have to be strong and you and I both know that there are people born strong. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up with guys like that. Um, I grew up in the country. Uh, everybody around me was strong, seemingly, because they had to wake up in the morning and work the cows and, and the horses and take care of everything. Hey, before they went to school. Um, but not everybody fully taps into what their genetics can do. 
And at the end of the day, we're all human science projects. We are all constantly adapting and uh, adjusting organisms that are going through life, kind of bouncing off things as things are happening to us and as we're happening to things. And because of that, that influence can be paramount. You know, if you take an individual who's already strong or has, has a genetic opportunity to be, to be genetic propensity to be strong and you, you push that and you nurture it, it's no different than a kid who shows a tendency to be talented on the piano and you, you push that with the making them practice every single day, 30 or 45 minutes when they don't want to, they want to go outside. They want to play with their friends, you know, but you see that they've got potential. You see that they've got talent. That's never going to be realized. It's never going to go anywhere. They may always be able to play piano. Absolutely. But without that, that someone to guide, a coach, to push and nurture and, and get the most out of that talent, it's wasted. But they have to have it, too. You know, I grew up as I played piano since I was five, and my mom forced that on me. Um, but it taught me discipline, and it taught me to be able to have an awareness of seeing the difference in myself between when I put in effort and when I put in no effort, when I just called it in, when I worked at something. And as I began to be a youngster and moving forward and seeing, man, this is profoundly different when I apply myself and go all in on the end result compared to when I just sit down him haul around and, and just kind of phone it in because I'm kind of good at this anyway and I can do it. It's like even at a very young age that started to teach me there is a whole lot difference that happens when you apply yourself in whatever it is and when you don't apply yourself. And that that can be training, that can be diet, that can be um, that can be the gear situation. You know, you're jumping on it at the start or you're jumping on it after you've got a foundation. Um, so many things that applies to. And, and I think it's having that influence in that that right coach, that right environment. And I think I have a little different perspective than most people I speak to on this because, you know, they'll, you know, the, the, the typical things that get thrown around is, you know, the, the work ethic isn't the same as it used to be or whatever. It's, you know, and I've been doing this shit for 40 years. And the way I've always kind of looked at it is the top 5% is still the top 5%, right? I think the only difference now is we can see the 95% that don't want it bad enough where before we couldn't, where there's, there's still no more top 5%, right? right? So the, right. The, the majority, of the, 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 and it would be the majority, the majority of the people that don't want to put in the work necessary to accomplish what they think. And I say think because maybe they just changed their mind because they realize this is more than what I thought. Right. What they think or thought that they want to do is no different than it's ever been. You know, the, the people that, are going to find a way, mm -hmm. are still going to find a way. Right. If it's getting the meals in or doing this and doing that. And it's a great world that we're in now because there's so many ways and so many different people to help guide those people right. that are gonna figure it out, yes. right? They're also gonna figure out this is bullshit, this is not bullshit. They're going, you know how we know they're gonna figure it out? Because we've seen them mm -hmm. over the last 20 years yeah. and they're, they just keep, mm -hmm. new ones keep coming all the time. And it's like, holy shit, they're better than they were before. <laughs> like if this is going the wrong direction, right. like everybody says, mm -hmm. then they wouldn't be getting better. Right. They'd be getting worse. It's actually going in a better direction. And it's just the, the people who don't want to do the work for whatever reason, you know, are more visible, right? So it's, it's, mm -hmm. it should be motivating, right. you know, to the, should be. The, it was, should be, I mean, to mm -hmm. the younger ones that I speak to, I'm like, look, man, if 95% of your competition doesn't want to do the work, then you can kick all kinds of ass if you do the work, right? but you got to do the work. Yep. You know, because sometimes they don't know what that work really entails and that the training, I think they get right. Kind of. They get that more than they do the other aspects. They get the training, but they may not understand even with powerlifting, the nutritional aspects. And some of it is there's been a disconnect for a lot of years. Just eat tons of food and you'll be fine. And with that comes well even when the people were eating tons of food they were covering their bases mm -hmm. like 60 percent 70 if i mean if it's fucking six thousand seven thousand calories yeah. and 
60% of it's good, they're probably covering their bases mm -hmm. if they're doing it consistently. And um, now taking it to another level, that's, that's another thing where sometimes the conversation, and even ours did it a little bit, gets a little nuanced because we start, I think we spend too much time focusing on the people who we're not gonna convince because they're not gonna fucking do it anyhow. Right. Right, just realize it's a hobby, do it a couple times, tap out, leave, and leave it for the people who really wanna do it right. to go through. Because this is what's gonna happen anyhow. Mm -hmm. We've seen it, you know, over and over and over. Mm -hmm. Now for the other ones that do wanna do it, that becomes tricky. Right, because they're the ones that they have such a strong desire and yearning to want to be the best. They'd be your younger ones that are just, you know, full of piss and vinegar. And anytime something new comes around, you know, they're coming to you mm -hmm. and they're going to say, you know, hey, should we be doing this? Mm -hmm. You oh. know, and this is probably your world. Th that, yeah, and, and, and that comes along so much, especially with. Like you said, uh, younger, but I, I mean, somewhat, sometimes the older too. It's all um, of them. But, but as far as like, uh, you know, always thinking there's the latest and the greatest and, and somehow the wheel has been reinvented and especially that pertains with, with the gear and stuff like that and peptides and, and. <laughs> I get it though, man, because even if, even if they have been doing it for 25 years, they're still want to be the best and they don't want to leave anything out of the equation. Absolutely. You know, so that becomes that. But yes. what what they so often, though, want to do, though, is look at the easiest, most simplest thing, which is the thing right in front of them. And that is what, what does their recovery techniques and processes look like? What does, like you said, sleep? What does it sleep like? I can't think of any more basic free thing on this earth that you can do to enhance your performance and recovery then make sure you get some sleep. All right, well, let me let me throw this back to you because of some of the <laughs> population free. that you worked with. If they're pounding food, right, and then they're training fucking hard, and then they're running, not a shit, they're running basic gear, mm -hmm. right? So they're not peaking gear or anything like that. Sleep can, can become a problem. Oh. So how do you help mitigate that situation? Two things, and 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 it's kind of funny because one thing I'll find that, and I'm just, I'm just spitballing. Yeah. I'll find that guys, for some other, for some reason, especially, it seems to be more of a European tendency, but still, in, in general, f the young ones or the new clients that'll come to me, they're doing their injectables, they're doing all their shots, they're doing everything at night. Never does that make any sense to me whatsoever. Well, that's the easiest, my day's over and I can just get it in, I won't forget or whatever. Okay, you do realize that any steroid at the end of the day, even if it's just testosterone, it does have a neurostimulating effect, period. It, some are far more pronounced than others. But at the same time, t take that in the morning. Take that in the morning because it, even if it's something that you only do like once or twice a week, whatever, blah, 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 still take it in the morning because it's still going to positively impact in positively impact the remainder of your day, the way that your nutrition is received, because it has an influence on the way that nutrition is received. It has an influence on insulin sensitivity. Um, it has an influence on, of course, you know, uh, adrenaline and things like that. So for your training, depending on when you train, it's kind of like the guys with the pre-workouts, right? So the guy's like, well, I train at eight o'clock at night. So I pound a pre-workout at seven. And I can't get to sleep till one o'clock in the morning. Okay, well, then we need to find another avenue of doing this. Either you need to figure out a way that you train perhaps early in the day, or we need to find alternative methods that don't go over and above. You're, you're, you're taking a problem and shooting it with a cannon when you could probably shoot it just fine with your rifle. Mm -hmm. You know, So maybe we could get by with a cup or two of coffee and do your workout rather than hitting it with the pre-workout and doing your workout. There's always kind of a walk around or a solution, but it, it, there's that that tendency to all guns blazing, all or nothing, but it, it, it's the attractive, glamorous side, if that makes sense. It can strength. be, but with a straw man, it's a little different mm -hmm. than powerlifting, right? Mm -hmm. Because they have to move, mm -hmm. right? So if, in my experience, if, if the dose of things are too high, it's harder to pull oxygen, mm -hmm. right? So that's a you're dealing with a different specimen now right because they're not doing a one rep bout right you know so 
there's there's as you said earlier there's being big but then there's being big and being able to be moving mm -hmm. you know and doing the things and i think all strength athletes who are using gear are going to end up going to the point of diminishing returns i don't think there's any way to avoid no, that, that that's that's absolutely know, it's perfect. going to happen and um then it's convincing them mm -hmm. as fast as you can that mm -hmm. that's not really that what they want to do well that's and that's I'm blessed that because of all the, the the titles and stuff like that, even the most alpha of alpha personalities will let me say what I need to say to them with receptive ears um, because they want to maybe push back. But, well, but there's that. And that's hard, it's seven World Stars Man titles and four second places and three thirds in 15 years. That's that's hard to push back on. Well, but maybe that's not the way of, of going about it. And so that gives me some additional leeway so that I can have receptive on a bringing things down when people come to me and, and first take me on. I have never, I have never had it where we're talking about an upper level athlete who happens to be enhanced. I've got a lot of natural athletes who are at the top of the world, mm -hmm. but an enhanced athlete who didn't come to me where the, the first thing we're doing is we're pulling everything back by a half or less. And I'm basically switching everything out too, because what works for bodybuilding, what works for your buddy in the gym, who's big, what works for powerlifting, like you said, it is not the same because we got different things going on here. The real screw up is the bodybuilding guys who try to advise the strength guys. That is, that is a huge, huge problem. And because the bodybuilding guy doesn't give a damn. Like I said, he can walk up a flight of stairs. We, we, there's a different agenda, different goals. Yeah. He also doesn't care if his muscles are tight or if his joints are dry. Irrelevant. Yeah. A strength athlete had better not have dry joints. A strength athlete had better not have tight muscles. Some gear, some compounds, your muscles are tight. It's great for pre-contest for bodybuilding. That's what it's for. Terrible for a muscle that needs to be put under a tremendous load of stress and function with a high range of motion. So that's where I see just a lot of problems when guys will come to me and I look at it and I'm thinking, you getting ready for like a bodybuilding show I should know about? Like, what well, is I, this? Yeah, I'm not sure that the strength athlete needs to hold as much glycogen in the muscles as what the bodybuilders do mm -hmm. either, mm -hmm. right? Because it's- Can't move. Yeah, well, it's- Range of motion is reduced. Well, what ends up- <clears throat> happening in that I've seen happen on the powerlifting side, I'm trying to keep things, you yes. know, so I'm not globally speaking here is, you know, say a use of insulin and stuff like that mm -hmm. to be able to mm -hmm. get bigger. Yeah. Right. They end up going up a weight class, but they're no stronger. Right. So great. Now you suck less, mm -hmm. you know, and, or you suck more, right? So you mm -hmm. suck more because of that. So yes, you're bigger, but well, a few years ago, there was a trend, I guess, and it especially through Europe, it was my, from my observations, because there was somewhat of that happening here, uh, state wise, if you will. But I mean, I've been pretty advocate as far as like with my bodybuilding individuals. It, best way to give an example bodybuilding, you're trying to create an artificial human dome, basically, a completely artificial environment where everything's elevated. So your, you know, your testosterone levels, extremely elevated, your growth hormone levels, extremely elevated, your insulin, extremely elevated. You can do that because everything you're just taking what naturally is in sequence and you're massively amplifying it. And of course there's a give and take when you do that. Like you said, the functionality goes to shit, but you're big and you will grow at a very rapid rate, but it's not functional. You know, when it comes to a strength athlete of, of any sort, you're looking at trying to increase your response to the actions of insulin and insulin. That's the catch 22. But in bodybuilding, it's somewhat canceled out. So in bodybuilding, you know, let's say we've got ourselves a bodybuilder and they happen to be using various hormones plus growth hormone plus insulin. Growth hormone helps. Unfort doesn't help, but growth hormone raises over time, especially if you're, the amount you're taking is high enough, starts to make you pretty insulin resistant. Your blood sugar levels start to raise and you're kind of a, 
fake diabetic, if you will. Insulin helps to control mm -hmm. that and bring that down in play. So now you have insulin elevation in the system. You have growth hormone elevation system, androgens elevated in the system. You have this artificial superdome of productivity, if you will, <laughs> but diminishing returns because what ends up happening is over time that GH just continues to make the insulin sensitivity worse. The exogenous insulin that you're taking, repeated exposure to insulin makes the body less sensitive to the actions of insulin. So the key, especially with a performance athlete, when you're trying to enhance, like, enhance performance, is to increase your sensitivity to insulin so that you're more responsive to its actions. So you're not shutting off one for the benefit of the other, you know, because eventually over time you have nowhere to go. You know, if, if, if you can't respond because the GH is making you so insulin resistant and because you're having to take so much insulin, and I'm not going to say the amounts, but on the, yeah. on the level of a high level bodybuilder these are it's a mm -hmm. very high amount and again you're constantly exposing so your cells just always have all this circulating and sensitivity is reduced so it's the same thing when somebody comes to you with it's on a very large high amount of of gear they're only on a high amount of gear a they don't know any better b they've made themselves very insensitive to the actions of gear which is the very reason why they take it in the first place it's no different than drinking if I don't drink for six months and I go out and have two beers, I'm going to feel a buzz. If I drink two beers every single day, not so much. If I drink a case, not so much. Then it's a, you know, a handle or whatever in order to kind of feel a thing. The human body is annoyingly adaptive. It, will, it wants to counter and react to the things that we do. So it will allow us to have a stimulatory effect from something for a while and then it's gone. It will allow us to get a beneficial response from something and then it's gone. And you can see that across everything. You can see that across prescription medications for diseases, for treatments, for cancer. Everything at first and in all the studies that they do, which allows them to bring it to market, shows a beneficial effect that it elicits. But over time and repeated exposure, those benefits begin to wane. So the key, especially with athletes, tends to be how can I increase my sensitivity to something to get the most out of it. You know, it's like, it's like trying to fill, like I could be, I'm thirsty. So I can fill this bottle full of water from the fountain over there, or I could go fill it with the fire hose from the fire station. Both are going to get that bottle full of water. One is going to be an efficient use and one is going to have spillover and shit all over the place, you know, with the fire hose. So it's trying to get people to back off that mentality more is not more is not more. And I would know I'm the one with protocols going for an enhanced athlete that that makes the responses and the end result happen that it does. So I would think if I say y'all out there for the most part are taking way too much shit, way more than those who you think are and what they are, I'm probably pretty good authority on that. Oh, yeah. And I would wear. The, the anabolics aside where, the, say, the growth hormone and the insulin, that to me, that's more tied nutritionally than the anabolics. You know, it's obviously because it's the insulin. And um, where if I can make a case to where it can be beneficial through recovery phase, through different phases, you know, to have that in where it becomes a very hard conversation because doses of insulin will kill people, yes. you know, so there's, there's that problem there. But what I didn't think of until you were speaking, if you're trying to develop this insulin sensitivity modulation or however you want to see that over a period of time, then I could see phases where it would come in because it's going to work with it and it gets it to how, however it's going to go in there. But if it's always there, Correct. then you're dealing with fuckery yes. that is going to, over a period of time, not work as well right. as it normally would. So say somebody has to, they're not going to have to make weight, but somebody has to make weight and they're going to come up after making weight, mm -hmm. then 
it can help shuttle, mm -hmm. you know, where there's a point, but not if you're fucking using it all the time. Exactly. Then it wouldn't work as well. Or if you just use it out of nowhere, you know, that comes into play where you can get in this weird ass position because they're just going to start using it. So if they start taking growth, the insulin's not far down the road, mm -hmm. right? It's normally, it's, it's a part of it from the start mm -hmm. because it's cheaper, right? And as you said, as one goes up, the other mm -hmm. is going to have to counter that. But you got to play with that with the, with the nutrition, mm -hmm. right? Because right. If and that's that's where it gets dicey, though. Because if you have an individual who, um, and when I work with bodybuilders, you know, I'm I just approach it entirely different. I have to. So when I when you're working with a bodybuilder, there's that type of a goal, and there's the the large exogenous insulin, large exogenous GH, and things like that. From a diet standpoint, and 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 you probably are well aware, the manipulating of the diet loses a lot of its ability when you're talking about that scenario okay and it becomes a manipulating that has to occur through drugs and gear because the diet you can put in the same amount of carbohydrates and protein or whatever for an individual you know who's on x amount of insulin x amount of gh okay the problem is when you're trying to increase that and get a response out of them my putting more food in, more carbohydrates, let's say, in this kid situation, well, since they're already having to have an artificial means in the first place, they're actually not, their body actually is not really responding. The pharmaceutical is doing the responding. The body's sort of turned off. The pharmaceutical is doing the responding. So the manipulating, I could double somebody's carbohydrates. That's not going to elicit any sort of a response performance-wise or anything if the insulin and GH actually isn't the thing that moves where you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. I no longer have that ability to manipulate nutrition to do the work. I have to now let the gear and manipulate the gear to actually do the work, to let the gear actually do more, elicit more of a response from just the regular baseline food because the body's not really acting. There's, there's no, there's no flow. You know, when you're getting a reaction out of somebody manipulating through their diet and through their nutrition, you give them more carbohydrates, something happens. You give them more protein, something happens. And it happens as such. And the same when you're peeking into that contest to get the body to go above and beyond, hit PRs, set records, mm -hmm. whatever the case is. You have that ability to put it out there and get a response, get it, provided you've conditioned it along the way and made that situation. In that type of other world where it's all exogenous, it's just it becomes a game of more to get a response and more to get a response. Cause the food is the body is not actually the thing responding to it. When, when you're flooded with insulin, your body's not making an, and there's no insulin response to be had. So you would have to take more insulin to accommodate for that carbohydrate. Well, you're not actually manipulating anything per se through the diet. You're manipulating the gear mm -hmm. or in that case, the drug the insulin to have that response. So you actually have far less control over the end result than you think you do compared to the individual who is approaching it more from, and again, not the show version, but the individual from a performance standpoint who's choosing instead to manipulate things from a food standpoint and to get the body to pop. That's where I was trying to go with this is when you're dealing with not the, a show version, but like you said earlier, a go mm -hmm. version, then that would be a much harder variable to work around because you won't be able to gather that. And, and that's why, though, you that's see, right. how many times do you, when you program for somebody and you're, or yourself, whatever it is, how many times, regardless of, and not even a show, just when you program a block, how, how often a percentage would you see that they hit the numbers that you pretty much expect them to hit based off what you programmed? For, for an individual who's following through and doing everything as it should I mean, be. No, if it's following through and they're doing it, it can be a yes. higher percentage. So we can get 70, 80 percent. Uh, now, now that uh, there's something changed every session, though. Of course. Yeah. On that show version, if you will, how many guys miss the mark on their contest? They don't peak. They blow it. The guy that should be first is seventh. The guy that should be fifth mm -hmm. doesn't finish. Everybody places all over the place. The, the consistency isn't there. Mm -hmm. And that's where dietary adjustments are being made. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
but you're losing a lot of the control that you ideally and ultimately need to really be able to always kind of hit it. You're using that because this other thing is working and doing and it's kind of governing or reducing what you're able to do. Mm -hmm. So, so getting back to the, the metrics that you're looking at as you're dialing somebody, or as you're working with somebody, there's what feedback are you looking for? So regardless if it's two, three, four, five meals, and you're moving them closer to whatever they're training for, it's, mm -hmm. my brain stops because yeah, everything's a block in my mm -hmm. brain, right? right? So every block's a little different. So we'll say if they're moving towards a recovery type of block. So it's something that's post competition, six weeks, whatever they're gonna have for not really recovery, but whatever they would consider off season condition and I even can rest recuperation and maybe hypertrophy. Right. So it's probably the easiest face mm -hmm. to kind of manipulate. I would assume what markers are you looking at for changes to occur in the, the diet? Uh, the main thing is that I'm, I'm listening for that feedback that, that a they're, they're hitting the numbers that you put out them for the hit. If they're missing their numbers, People are going to have a miss like this week or that week. Who knows? You know, could be all kinds of different influences from their lives or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, or myself, I missed it, whatever. But they could have a, a week where they miss. But something, if something happens once, I kind of tend to occur. Okay, well, that's kind of a chance. Or that's an occasion. If something happens two or three times, now it's consistent and now it's a problem. And so it, well, let me stop you. What if their training <laughs> sucks? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I know you've gotten this position before. What if you know that this training is just out of hand? Do you, can you, are you comfortable saying oh, yeah. to them, like, look, this is too fucking much? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because I'm assuming you're not doing that, that no. somebody else is doing that or they're well, and, doing and that. And that's the fascinating thing, too, on my end, because of having individuals around the world and all these different sports, even within the same sport, so many, they're, the majority are using so many different training mm -hmm. coaches, so many different training styles, and it, it, it's unbelievable. And so I get to see like kind of the effects of all these different training things going on with all these different people. And they train, they change training scenarios often. I mean, I'll, I'll see guys pop from thing to thing to thing every year or two years um, and, and kind of on to the next when it comes to the training and what, what you'll typically see is that, that as that training starts to wane, what I have to start doing on my end is being creative. <laughs> it's going to sound ridiculous, but part of what I do, I think, is I try to, to incorporate a lot of the mental aspect and, and be either a little bit ahead for the client or, to, or sometimes just assume the worst on the client. And then I kind of lay things out. I think things are probably like this. I think maybe they're really actually only getting in there once or twice a week because they're just fucking burned out on training or they have too many nagging things that, you know, strongman, it, it, it's kind of like human NASCAR. I mean, you know, you, you build the very best race car you possibly can, and then they've got the best drivers to drive that race car, and then somebody rubs up against somebody and they flip into the wall, and there you go. And there's yeah. so much of this random element, and then they're dealing with this injury or that strain or whatever kind of starts to get burned out on some that I've noticed from time to time. And as they start to miss training, to start to do whatever, it becomes a kind of a treat reward scenario that tends to work well in order to, you almost make them want to miss the diet. You almost make them want to miss in turn then that training session. Like they miss the familiarity that they kind of take for granted at the moment. So they're skipping the trainings because oh, it'll be there next week. I got squats. I'll squat then. Well, who cares if I blow off this one or I've got event day, whatever. I'll have event day next week. Who cares if I miss it? Well, I can kind of put in things if I know they're having that issue and or if their coach speaks with me, some some work independently and I react to them. Some work, some react off of me. There's no one way, just like there's no one way to diet. It's got to be whatever happens to work for that, yeah. that person in their lifestyle and their training. So basically it'll be like, hey, let's go ahead and, and I'll plug in two or three cheat meals, but I'll let them know that these cheat meals are because you've got this big training session coming up or you're at this part of the block. In order for us to jump to where you need to be in two weeks, I'm going to go ahead and, and really start pounding the food 
and it's going to be a little bit of the junky stuff you like, or I'll start adding desserts into things. Basically because I'm trying to give them a happy place to go in order to start to look forward to that training that they're about to blow off or that they want to blow off because they're like, oh, fuck, I want to blow off squats, but, uh, you know, Nathan's got this programmed in and that programmed in, and I do like cheesecake. You know, it kind of gives them a little bit of a, of a vacation, if you will, mm -hmm. of the diet. Now, is it the diet as written? No. Is it the perfect, uh, you know, strength thing that a person can get from it? No. But is it going to patch and fill in a gap and get them through so that they can eventually get back to it? More often than not, yeah. So I said, if it's almost a check and balance system, yes. right? To where I can see where I used to think that it would be most optimal. I still do think it's most optimal if you kind of knew what the training was at least a week ahead of time. Mm -hmm. That would probably make a big difference. Optimally a month, you know, optimally right. the further you right. would know. And I guess as they're peaking for something, you kind of know what the last mm -hmm. month's going to look like, you know, going into that. But at the same time, there's a part of me that's thinking now, maybe more separations better because it does provide this check and balance system. And exactly. And so often the individual I, I, that I do get the training things from those individuals, um, life happens. And so I can program in something, but their kid hurt their foot at soccer or whatever. So they've got to scamper off to that and they miss that training that maybe I was going to load. Maybe I did program it and load them up for it, you know, or I programmed in to load up the recovery aspect of it because I just knew it was going to tear them down and depending on what the, the actual training encompassed. So you can have a situation like that too. And it's like, well, which way do you go or do you just, like I said, you kind of go for sunshine and rainbows and kind of play into that human psyche that kind of says, if you can present something pleasant or attainable, that's super easy, I probably get through that. And that ends up being the ultimate kind of patch on the tire yeah. until they kind of come back around. Now, with most that you're working with at the higher level, the, they're probably not pushing to gain weight, right? They're maintaining the weight or pushing closer a little of both actually. a little of both so mm -hmm. pushing towards mm -hmm. i can see how the weight would fall off a little mm -hmm. bit you know after the show then you'd have to put it back to push mm -hmm. on so them aside the ones that are rising in the sport you know that are trying to put on weight i've heard you say you know there's a note in here too something about you don't do calories mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. what how what does that look like if with that process of pushing them to gain weight? Because obviously there has to be some type of surplus. Mm -hmm. And does the surplus just keep going or does it physically structure? Yeah, it'll physically structure. And I'll oftentimes to kind of it's kind of like a driving a race car, you know, I'll floor it and I'll back off. I'll floor it and I'll back off. It's like going around the track um, in order to kind of modulate that type of response because for that individual who's who's kind of a hard gainer or ha having that type of a of a challenge you can't just pound it with even more food because typically they're already a hard gainer because it's hard for them to eat a lot of food mm -hmm. so you're trying to be kind of one step ahead of that but using things i don't count calories because that's that whole life thing so the calories that an individual uses let's say on a sunday so let's say that they figure out that they burn, you know, whatever, 3,800 calories a day. That's kind of their, their threshold. That's their norm. Me putting in a 500 calorie surplus doesn't necessarily tell the whole story because, well, what if Monday is incredibly intensive because of their job or their training session? It's an incredibly intensive program thing on that. There's no way to determine that the body's actually going to sit there, do math and go, okay, today Dave went to target for three hours, ran back to the gym, went to Home Depot, went home, trained. And then the next day, Dave woke up and read a book on the porch. It was a beautiful day. There's no way for the body to sit there, break out its calculator and do math at the cellular level and go, okay, you're the 3,500 calorie man. I just don't prescribe to that. And I also have a problem with, with the ideal that a thousand calories is a thousand calories. Now at, at its core from an energy experience, yes. But I'm just talking about from like a, a body standpoint, if you will, and trying to, to manipulate or change things from either appearance or performance. A thousand calories from a ribeye will elicit a very different response in the body than a thousand calories of, say, the gummy bears or a thousand calories from Rice Krispie Treats. Let's do that. 
you know, so clearly, clearly, it is not just, well, the important thing for me to focus on as a strength athlete is, is the calories in, in my world with the way I write diets. Um, it works plenty fine for all these other amazing individuals, and that's the technique they use, and it works clearly. But for myself, I need to focus on more like moving the macros and moving the things that I know are going to manipulate. So rather than increase some 500 calories per day to increase them, you know, 3,500 over the course of a week or something like that, I would far rather increase just their protein grams per day up based off of whatever I have them on along with, again, remember they're in that, that bubble along with carbohydrates to make sure that protein is really going to do what I expect it to do when I increase it or the fats or sometimes both, you know, whatever I far more address and move the macros up or down, um, rather than I sit there and calculate the calories. Because for me in my world, I have found with the way that my diets are written, that for me elicits the best and most controllable response in my, in my end result on that client. Either their energy and fuel for training immediately goes up, and it's, boop, solves that problem. Or their recovery from session to session immediately improves, boop, solves that problem because of the protein or because of the carbs and, and fats. So that's the way that I work it within my system and why I do it basically that way. So you'll move all three? Um, or or two, depending on the individual. Yeah, I may have yeah. an individual who I know is very carb sensitive. Yeah. So their carbs may come up a little. I may, like let's say I increase their carbs 50 grams a day. I might increase their protein 75 grams a day. I might increase their fats and keep that lower. Or if I have an individual who's, who's, you know, extremely sensitive to all the macros, then kind of everything can come up a little bit in unison in, in a gaining type of scenario. Yeah, well, the, the reason I'm asking, I know a lot of nutrition coaches that the protein never moves. It's mm -hmm. like set at whatever they think it needs to be set mm -hmm. at. And then the other variables move mm -hmm. where, you know, you're, you're manipulating because all. often in my world, I've, I've got gentlemen that are getting in vehicular crashes daily. Mm, mm, in their training mm, mm -hmm. and and they're literally getting torn apart i i don't have i don't I, i'm all in on and i under, and i have done it that way that's when a good i point. when that's i have all point. the parameters in play that are controllable when i have that so uh, you know let's say a bodybuilding situation everything is controllable from you know the, they're doing the hypertrophy sets their reps yeah. their all that stuff is there so that's so controllable and the impact on the body and is is very expected within a certain range. Strongman and powerlifting, and especially strongman, it they're in car crashes every single day. It, it, you can't run around with 1,300 pounds on your back. You can't do 450 pound logs. Mm -hmm. You know, for repetitions, they are getting pummeled. So the amount of muscular damage that occurs far exceeds because it's muscles, it's tendons. It's the nervous system. Everything is getting just absolutely bludgeoned. So I can't, I can't find myself successfully pulling off just increasing a caloric thing or just increasing carbs or fats and leaving the protein alone because their protein requirements can fluctuate so much sometimes because of the, the way they just tear themselves apart. The, the rate of gain per week, where, where do you like to see them fall? I don't necessarily focus as much on the scale gain per week as much as I want to hear what their weight belt tells me each week. So if they tell me that the scale's going up two or three pounds and their weight belt's in the same notch, we're good. If the scale's going up three or four pounds and they had to had to go out a notch, I'm, I'm missing the mark somewhere. And I need to take a deep dive on where it is that I missed it for the client because they're actually out gaining fat than they are muscle or bloated yes yeah. either or yeah, yeah, needs yeah, me to sure. go under the yeah. hood and see like okay like where can i improve this at because that's really not where my end result is you know if it's a 700 pound squat and a 300 pound lifter i've got a thousand pounds in motion you know i'd rather have a i'd rather have a 710 pound squat and a 290 pound lifter you know, or, or, or so on and so forth if something's got to increase it's almost like i kind of like the body recomp thing Unless it's an individual who, based on their frame size, can either carry a lot of weight. You got a lot of frame, you can carry a lot of weight. And at the end of the day, that part of mass moves mass, I think, is real. I mean, a bulldozer can move a flower basket just as a little girl can move a flower basket on her bicycle. 
Yeah. You know, so I think that you need to be able to take that bulldozer and put, you know, a, a whole motorcycle army on top of the bulldozer if you needed to, and it can handle it just fine. Whereas you need to be a little bit more selective on kind of the smaller individuals to make sure that that fat pace, that fat gain pace isn't outmatching or the bloat, the strength thing. Sometimes, I'll be honest, you have to turn a blind eye if the lifts are still going up. <laughs> If, if I've got an individual who they're like, hey, the, the, I had to take the belt out of loop and my weights, uh, you know, I'm up four pounds this week, but they're just crushing their lifts. You, you know, you don't you don't mess with it if it ain't broke. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, you, yeah. you let that ride if your ultimate goal is strength. You know, I have to keep that in mind, too. If you're if that parameter is still moving and advancing forward, well, then I do need to take kind of a back seat on. OK, well. I guess I'm going to go ahead and let them gain fat at a little bit faster rate because look at the overall impact. Well, what if the ultimate goal isn't strength, but it is when you worked with Travis to pull his weight down mm. from, what, 330 to 275 or something yeah. like that? Honestly, he was about 260, that, Two, that Arnold, 260. that everybody shocked him. We just didn't tell anybody because it was so light. It was like 100 pounds less. Yeah. Like Derek Ponstone that year, I think Derek was like 350, 360. There's Travis at like 260. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it was unbelievable, you know? And... And when you're talking about that type of an individual, that is a case by case, because I can't honestly sit here and tell someone what I did for Travis. I'm going to be able to do exactly mm -hmm. the same for you. And you're going to have the exact same result doing it that way because your body may not respond that way. Travis is hyper responded in the way that we did things where his body was far more game to go ahead and go the body recomp route. And in that case, I've got, you know, muscle increases going on. I've got body fat coming down. And I've got, as his body fat goes down, his body was almost, you know, having an immediate response in liking that lightness so much that his energy levels, every, his endurance surged, which compensated for that reduced food intake, which should have normally been something that he felt. But it was compensated because the body was feeling so good because he'd been stressed so long with that amount of weight on it. Mm -hmm. that it's like it ended up going this way in order to produce that benefit. Well, that's the one thing I would wonder with the the strongman athletes is the amount of as you talked about the car crash type of thing but just the amount of accumulated inflammation that they're going to have from the training and also just from eating so fucking much yep. you know how do you deal with that or how do you how do you use is there a metric that you're using to be able to track that if it if it's blood work or other mm -hmm. metrics yeah. for that yeah they'll do blood work and then all the different things too that kind of when the inflammation, inflammation almost always will run hand in hand with, with either the first or the secondary impact on that central nervous system. You know, inflammation can just start to get out of control because the body's always beat up because the nervous system's always, always in distress. So inflammation ends up being, you know, just this massive cortisol, just cocktail. Mess, yeah. yeah, it's just you're just swimming in cortisol yeah. from every and any direction of the sun. That, of course, also disrupts the gut biome and all kinds of stuff, too. When you have all those going on, your electrolyte balance, everything just goes to just goes to mess. shit. Yeah. So when you're able to kind of observe and see those things and and you've seen it because of all the different athletes and you're like, oh, I know what this is. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like what is that TV show, Dr. House? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's yeah. like, you know, he's coming up yeah. with like the goofiest, wackiest shit over what caused that hangnail. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, how the hell did you it, it, seen it, been there, done that? Yeah. And you see those familiarities and you don't always have the answer but you have a good metric for where to start and then refine it from there and get the solution for that individual. Well, that would be what I was going to say is where, where, where's the first steps? Because it's, I know what, I, mean, I think many people that are listening know what we're talking about here, but I mean, it is a, it's a spiral mess and you got to catch it, mm -hmm. right? It, it, you either catch it or you got to figure out how to ride it until the competition and hope they don't get too fucked up. Right. Right. So it, it's a timing thing. Mm -hmm. Like if it's too close, you got to mm -hmm. figure out how to ride it and not get destroyed. If it's too far out, you got to figure out how to get out of this. Right. So what, what's the first steps? The first step is making sure that a, a lot of the clients from their end questionnaire and the information that they give me, they'll list foods that they've noticed that they've had sensitivities to. They've noticed things that they don't seem to tolerate well and stuff like that. Well, those are all going to any kind of a food intolerance or allergen is going to elicit an inflammatory response at the core. And when you pair that with the inflammatory yeah. response of all that goes on in a contest prep, yeah, things can get crazy real fast. 
So it's ensuring that if any of the food items that I'm already aware somebody may have a intolerance to or something, pulling that out to at least start to have some sort of a beneficial impact on getting that inflammation down, as well as continue to watch because I'll typically see patterns. Like, so somebody might say, hey, uh, you know, um, I might notice two or three weeks in a row, they mentioned that they're feeling a little bit bloated, especially after squat day or especially whatever. Well, squat is going to elicit more inflammation. Most people will weigh more the day after squats, you know, because of A, you know, you're holding more fluid in general, but B, the inflammatory response. And so a lot of individuals will give me that type of feedback and I'll notice it, but I'll also notice that they're very habitual in the foods that they eat prior to squats or on squat day in general. And so let, let's say I might notice an individual tends to always start the day every day when they're having the squats or whatever with eggs, you know, something like that. It's, it's like, I'll start to see patterns and I'll be like, they might not have had an intolerance, if you will, to eggs at the start, but their body is beginning to at least have some sort of a reaction to it in the giant cocktail of shit that is going on of this prep that yeah. is beating the hell out of them. Because during that prep, the body basically begins to dislike everything. It's throwing a temper tantrum. And so I'll look for things like that, that I can see a pattern of, hey, you're always, let's go ahead and pull that out. And let's go ahead and do this. And hey, you did tell me that you have an intolerance with this, or at least you noticed that you don't feel very good when you have, let's say, milk. So we're going to pull that out too, you know, because I need to at least give you some things that even if they're only 10, 15% of the contributor here, and the beat down is still the main thing that's going on, along with everything else of a cycle peak, it's like we can at least start to give the body some sort of a breather on that. Another thing that I'll do is I'll try to put like a flush day in. So, I mean, I'll have clients like Martins. He would have issues where the inflammation was getting just out of control and his body, because he had, he had, just had stem cells and he's had a lot of things that he ended, had, ended up having to have done. And so he, you know, actually asked me, he's like, hey, do you think, what's your take on intermittent fasting? And I'm like, okay, from, from a strength athlete trying to be able to move from point A to point B and actively recover in time, and make sure he's not setting himself up to be susceptible to injury. I said, not typically. I said, however, in your case, given it is an opportunity that we can maybe have a, almost a flush day, if you will, if we put that in, but you've got to be smart about it. And so what we did is, you know, basically one day a week, he'd put it in for 24 to 36 hours. You know, he would fast, he of course, still had water, but he would fast from the food standpoint of things in order to get the body to flush, to let go of a lot of that fluid retention that's part of the whole hyperinflammation. And he had to make sure that the, the first workout that he did coming out of that fast was not, you know, deadlift day. Yeah. It was basically like either accessory type work, accessory type day. And the same thing when he started that fast, he needed to make sure that he didn't start his fasting day. Here we go again with deadlifts. Um, you know, let's say right after deadlift day, because he's got recovery needs. So I found that if I do that, I'm able to mitigate a pretty predictable response that helps to control that type of inflammation if you can put it into that schedule like that so that it doesn't compromise them progress-wise, training fuel-wise, or recovery especially. So that's actually kind of something that I've begun to implement with several people here and there where I'll put it in if I start to hear and or see those type of inflammation things is basically like, well... Food can be an inflammatory trigger. Training can be an inflammatory trigger. Your stress can be an inflammatory trigger. All these things. We can kind of take a sabbatical. And I have found it to be very beneficial, you know, in that type of thing. I also use melatonin and uh, zinc and magnesium or ZMA, just depending on what people have access to. I use that specifically post-contest. So it could be powerlifting. It can be, um, you know, strongman, whatever. That typical time where they... You know, everybody's got the blues after the contest. You just feel kind of depressed. You just feel down. You go in the gym and even your opening weights feel like a school bus and mm -hmm. you're just pissed because, you know, and, and you're just like, Man, screw this. It's it, Again, it's it's inflammation. It's the central nervous system has just been beat down. And I've had tremendous success using like three milligrams of melatonin with a ZMA, which is like 450 magnesium and like 30, I think, on the zinc. Um, sometimes I'll go 60, though, on individuals, especially if they're bigger. Um, I have a lifter, you know, Shelly Stetner, she's 72 years old, you know, and she just crushes her powerlifting and she has about every record there is. And she's a little bitty thing, you know, and the same thing, like I use that for her and the, res the, the combination of that has been incredible in keeping her recovery, 
totally on par. She trains very hard, keeping her recovery totally on par, keeping the, the type of, you know, blues post-contest controlled and keeping the inflammation down. And she'll be the first one to notice that when she starts to have foods that she knows she's a little intolerant to too much, that her inflammation definitely rises and stuff. And so she chops that right back out and, and she flushes pretty quickly. Getting back to peaking the nutrition into mm -hmm. the actual contest to be able, because I mean, it's multiple days, you know, of events mm -hmm. and, you know, Martins and some of you guys do better, you know, as, as the, the days go goes on. on. So, mm -hmm. and that's something that nutritionally we talked about earlier is being prepared for. Mm -hmm. What does that generally look like in the peak phase running for the, the show? Especially when we've got multiple day contests. Uh, sometimes the Euro contest will be a one day thing, like a rock concert and it's four hours on a Saturday night is done. Most of the time it's a two day affair or a, you know, several day affair, either like a world stars man or something like that. When I have multiple days, then that's a little different than when I have a singular show. When I have a singular show, that peak week is all every day. We're building up a little bit more and a little bit more from the sensitivity that we've created during that 8, 10, 12 week cycle, whatever we've been on with their diet protocol. So it's then starting to exploit in a little bit more, a little bit more of the dirtier foods because I want the increased carbohydrates. I want the increased sodium. I'm not very concerned about protein because everybody, pretty much everybody goes into a deload week. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're not tearing things down at that point. We're done and we're not going to build any appreciable muscle during that period of time either. The work is in and it is what it is. So now the standpoint and the focus is on fuel and recovery. So from that point on, it's a little bit more carbs, a little bit more fat and dirtying it up because again, kind of the stimulatory effect, but I want that increased carbohydrate and increased sodium that comes with dirty foods. You know, if you roll through uh, five guys and you get yourself your five guy burger and, and your French fries, you know, we're having an influx there, obviously of the more dirty foods and more of a stimulant, but we're also starting to preload a bit on the sodium and the potassium also that comes from the French fries. So, doing food like that, I'm kind of using that in a manner that some people might just rely on like hydration shakes for or electrolyte drinks. And I'm big on the speed of things. So the quicker something gets in you, usually the quicker it gets out of you. Yeah. And I like to use food as a source of those types of things. I just think it sticks to the ribs longer, as grandma used to say. So we start to build that up going into the show. And then when I get to like the morning and the night of, then it becomes a huge focus on carbohydrate and fat. I'm storing up fuel sources that they can exploit. And, and again, protein actually starts to come down. So their protein intake might go about half when we get about that day prior. And it's just more carbohydrates and more fats the night before and then the morning of. Then when it's a multi-show contest, then it's, it, then it's case by case guy again continuing on do I have a recovery focus I need to address or do I need to just fuel them back up and let them floor it again when they get out there? Some guys are banged up after a particular event or a particular contest or feeling a strain. So then I've got to address a recovery need. And at the same time, I've got to refuel them for the next day or the next two days. So is the recovery days. need going to be addressed with protein? Yes. Okay. Then the protein goes up and specifically yes. that nighttime time frame because while they're sleeping and the body wants to do the repair anyway. All right. So you have to decide is this is this protein is this heavier on protein or heavier on carbs? Right. Now in between events or during that time, the the carbs are is the decision being made between complex simple based upon the recovery between. I'm not big on complex ever. Yes. I'm more simple carbs and more of them. Yes. Because simple carbs, depending on the pain, like the Rice Krispie bars, the reason why I became known as that guy, I've been using them for 20 years, is because they are a dense form of carbohydrate, okay, that is dry. And the reason why that's important in my world and the way I do the diets is because I have to think ahead of what this contest entails what the demands are on my athletes. A lot of times, World Stars Man, it might be 115 degrees in Sacramento. They're out on the blacktop with no cover doing these events. The amount of fluid loss is astronomical. Well, you can mitigate fluid loss if you can find a way to keep some fluid in you a little bit. You know, you still have to compensate, obviously, with electrolytes and things yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. too. 
but I like the dry form of carbohydrates such as the Rice Krispies Treat. A, it's a simple form of carbohydrates, a dry rice. That's pretty simple. It's got just a little bit of fat with it that doesn't really matter, but it helps to just extend it a little bit longer. But that dry carb tends to attract the fluid so that the fluid isn't as quick to just release and get out of you. Like when people do an Atkins type diet, keto, whatever you want to call it, you know, everybody has it. It's a constant fluid dump because there's no carbohydrates, no anything for your body to kind of hold on to. Re you know, it's about what every one gram of carbohydrate can store about, store about two or three grams mm -hmm. of, um, you know, water with it like a magnet. Well, it's the same kind of thing. So I want that dry carbohydrate to be the source of carbohydrate that's utilized and that can also help on the fluid side of things to try to help maintain some sort of hydration because water in, water out. If you're sitting there pounding hydration drinks all, drink, all day and that's your fluid approach, the more you put in, the more is going to come out. So also the fluid, like things like Gatorade and stuff like that, nobody on earth has ever slammed a Gatorade and hit their squat or deadlift you know, or done a strongman event and not felt the sloshing mm -hmm. in your gut from that Gatorade. If you can feel that, where is it? It's not in your muscles. So the carbohydrate reload that you had intended to have is still partially in your stomach along with that fluid. If the fluid is just trapped also in your stomach, that's also not a source of, of accurate hydration either. And so I found that kind of combining that with the, the little bit less on the hydration stuff, it's still your electrolytes, but with the dry carbohydrate source, I found that it stays longer in the system and it's able to facilitate that both as a carbohydrate source and as that kind of assistance there with the electrolytes, if you will, for the type of thing that those guys are since they're just purging nonstop. Now, is that going to be implemented throughout their, their their training leading into the meat. So let's just say pairing nutrition. Yeah. So as they're getting closer in and it's more of the meat and potatoes of the training block, then they'll start to have Rice Krispies like before kind of the main prime lift during their events. Some guys I found that I have that they respond even better to things like, uh, you know, brownies or, uh, you know, those types of things where again, they're a dense kind of a still a dry starch but they respond better to that even because there's a little bit more fat content with it than there is with the Krispies. So for those guys, I'll peel off and have them use that. Like I've got a couple of guys that respond better to that than they do the Krispies. And so then it becomes, if it's a long time between events, I'll go with the more fatty carb combo stuff that's still a dry starch base. Mm -hmm. the, and then when we get right up on an event, then it'll be more the simply thing like the just straight rice Krispie bar. So it's kind of like a long... And then I've got a fast to basically just top off right before. And you know this because of the training sessions leading in, which yes. one sticks better yes. and works better. With each person. Yes. yes. And, and mm -hmm. other things that you could throw in mm -hmm. to be able to experiment with mm -hmm. to change. And and Mike Van Den Dunn? Van, uh, Van Wick? Uh, uh, not Van Wick. Uh, Oh, uh, recovery. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Recovery mobility. Awesome guy. And he yeah. was at uh, World's Strongest Man. And... There were individuals, you know, of course, he's part of that and the IV bags and everything else. Yes. And there's an individual that was, you know, cramping repeatedly. It happened two or three times with a couple of individuals and they were doing that and they'd still fire back up with their hamstrings, just wouldn't release and stuff. And I was like, well, Mike, this is the way I do it. And so I took your basic hydration thing. I think there's a lot of things that can get lost in translation with dilution. And so I think sometimes if you have an immediate need and you overly dilute, I think you reduce the effectiveness because you've overly diluted which is kind of like the Gatorade sitting in the mm -hmm. stomach. That's in essence a form or an illustration of something, a carbohydrate source, if you will, that's overly diluted versus that Rice Krispies starts, which is ready to go as a carbohydrate source. And the digestion and absorption of the sugars can start in the mouth. As you start even to chew it, things can begin to happen from an absorption standpoint. So with that scenario, I was like, well, here's the way I do it. And I showed him how I'll take an electrolyte powder. You know, I can use about any one but I'll only use four, maybe five ounces of liquid. And I mean, it shut him off in probably two minutes. That hamstring completely released instantly and happened on two or three different occasions. And Mike was just like, what in the fuck just happened here? He's like, I, I've never seen anything that fast in my life. I said, well, I was like, you had an active situation that was underway. And I said, so in my world, I've just noticed that the more I dilute things, the longer I just delay the inevitable from happening or getting there. And I found that I can elicit a stronger effect if I dilute it in a more minimal sense 
like that with my guys where I can get it turned off. That happened with uh, Bobby Thompson, even at the Rogue, I think one or two years ago. And, and Bobby's a friend, but not a client, but he was in a situation they couldn't get his cramping to stop. It was the same thing. I said, here's this, and I gave it to him, and I didn't dilute it, and he... <laughs> That was the nastiest shit he ever had. Oh, I bet. Yeah. And the medic and the yeah. medical staff was in just total disbelief because they couldn't get him to shut off, and he immediately shut off within two minutes. And I was just like, I mean, you're a big bag. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a lot of dilution. Oh yeah, and, but IV too is going to yeah. take fucking forever. Right. And so it's like we had it now. If somebody was not in an active, yeah, I would never no, yeah, yeah, do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But when you have an active, so I was talking with Nick Best about that too out there in Wall Street, man. And, same kind of thing. He's like, damn. He's like, I never really thought about it like that. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, well, I'm out here in Vegas, and God dang it, it's hot. He goes, and that kind of thing happens. I'd be great to be able to just shut it. But it shouldn't be your go-to. No. So we should put that out no, there. No, absolutely. I mean, the go-to should be to avoid it in the first place. Exactly. Always stay a step ahead and don't find yourself in that situation. Yeah. But, I mean, you'll see that with food even. Individuals will take a protein drink. You know, a protein shake, and they'll mix it with like 25, 30 ounces, some gigantic bottle. And it's like you're diluting a lot of the digestive enzymes in the process that your body would like to utilize to efficiently basically handle that, which is in the same way that individuals overly drink with meals. You know, in my world, I'm a big believer that don't slam two big glasses of water while you're, or soda or whatever you have while you're sitting there bored waiting on your food to show up. Yeah, yes, you're going to feel a little bit more full, and that's uncomfortable. But, but at the end of the day, you've also kind of diluted the digestive enzyme pool, if you will, lack of a better term, that your body could have used to really hyper and efficiently utilize all those macros and send it off to where it's going to go. So I'm kind of big on just kind of making that one little glass of water last the whole meal. You know, sipping a little, two, three, as you're thirsty beforehand, and then several bites in, another two or three, and so on and so forth. But but I find a lot of people, if they do that, they find that I don't really bloat anymore after I eat. I don't understand. I've always, and I'm, they're like, how come my there? Well, because you didn't dilute the digestive enzymes your body could have utilized in order to that. And you're changing the rate and speed of digestion, stuff like that, from all the volume and the fluid pushing through. And so there's all kinds of things that you do like that that kind of elicit different responses. But yeah, it shouldn't, hydration should always be something that's kind of your man, your mandatory status quo and you don't ever want to find yourself in that situation well now the wheels are off the bus so yeah. what do we do and one of the notes you had down here was for to speak about instinctive eating so mm -hmm. what do you mean by that well and that that's funny because that actually goes back to nick best too we had that conversation where nick was like hey let me ask you something he's like i know you're supposed to always eat for, you know for recovery and this that and the other he goes, but man, dude, like, let's say the other day, the other day I squatted, you know, I was so happy because I was able to squat, you know, especially coming from, from what Nick's been going through. He was like, I felt great. He goes, man, I'm just not hungry after I squat. He goes, I just didn't eat. He goes, what do you think about that? I was like, I think you're listening to yourself. I think you're doing exactly what your body wants you to do because a very traumatic event such as squat. I mean, for all intents and purposes, that's traumatic on the body, especially with what powerlifters and strongmen do. So you go, for, you have a very traumatic event. Cortisol levels are going to surge. The body's just done a whole fight or flight thing and survival. It's not worried about like, okay, now where's the pizza? It's like, let me calm down a little bit. And I said, so what you felt with the whole not being hungry and all that, that's because A, a little bit of insulin resistance is going on naturally following lifts because of the cortisol spike. I said, and so that's reducing your appetite like that. But you taking cue of that and noticing that your appetite is reduced, that's your body's way of saying, I, you could give me something right now, but I'm not going to efficiently do all that much with it. Why don't you give me about an hour or two? And when that appetite kicks in because the cortisol levels start to come down a little bit, my nervous system starts to relax a bit, then I'm going to be able to make hyper use of those macros because exercise and activity increases insulin sensitivity. So if you've done an activity, you've put yourself in a positive situation in order to benefit from it, but most people will find that they kind of, they need to let that cortisol and that initial response post-training calm down itself in order to really take advantage of that increased insulin sensitivity once the dust settles, if you will. So right. that's listening to yourself yeah. with that instinctive eating, like, I'm not really hungry right now. Well, kind of start to look for patterns. And in Nick's case, he specifically had mentioned, every time I squat, I'm never hungry, I don't ever want to eat. So I was like, ah, oh, try this. And he's like, son of a bitch. <laughs> that's interesting because when 
there was a time I was training with John Meadows on Saturdays and the leg training was just fucking stupid. Um, but it was just, it was just a process of how much worse can each Saturday get than the Saturday before. <laughs> and, um, it was hard. They were, they were really hard to recover from, you know, for me and it, for him as well. It was really hard to recover from. So I was very adamant for a while of trying to, you know, get post training shake and try to get all the shit to be, and nothing was fucking helping. And then one day, you know, it's just, I got home and I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just going to lay in bed. I'm just fucking lay in bed with pillows under my knees and just chilled out for, I don't know, two and a half, three. It's, I had to stay hydrated. Yeah. I cramped like oh, a yeah. motherfucker. So staying hydrated for like two or three hours and then just ate and then, you know, ate the rest of the day as I normally would. And I wasn't sore. Exactly. <laughs> and I remember calling John. I'm like, wait a minute. Uh -huh. like, this is, goes fucking against everything right. that I'm thinking right now. And um, he's telling me he's doing the same thing. Yeah. You know, it's, he was doing it before. He wasn't telling me. You know, it just, he says, you got to give space, yep. you know, because your body just went through hell. Which, which is what I do with my guys, too, post-contest. So after events, even though they've just depleted and a lot of times their blood sugar levels are coming down, I do not immediately jam something in their mouth. You know, they'll be like, can I, should I eat something now? Can I eat something now? Like, ah. Yeah. Let your body calm down from the traffic accident. Yeah. Get its bearings because you're not going to efficiently use anything anyway. And then you'll shuttle it in. Yeah. Now, I should, we should know that this is an extraordinary circumstance, right? right? Where a normal circumstance Correct. is not going to be the case at all. Right. Um, how do you approach the um, pre and because we talked about the peri, but pre and post training as mm -hmm. far as nutrition, do you treat that all as one meal or do you treat those as separate meals? And what's the timing around that? Um, typically, I like I don't like to um, I don't like to have like, let's say your pre training meal is always this or your post training yeah. meal is always that. My guys know that wherever they, wherever their training lands in their day, A, if they've on the questionnaire and everything else, they tell me their times. So I build the diet out with it in mind that your training meal is it, you know, you're, you train at three. So the odds are, you know, your lunch is going to be about your pre-training meal. And then I have to factor in that you also might train for two and a half or three hours. So we have a, have a window here. And so I'll kind of move things around on that where I'll be like, okay, this is your regular meal. And I just want you to have your regular meal on a training day. If it's if it's if you don't train that day, just have the meal. If you do train that day, you still have your meal. And I either have them add to it depending on the person, or I'll have them take if their pre-training meal was later in the day and they've moved their time around or something for whatever reason. I'll have them move that up and put that in front of the meal in order to try to compensate. So the pre-training meal is never like, um, okay, because you're training you're always going to have an extra 100 grams mm -hmm. of carbs. It's always you're going to train, and it's going to be that meal, and we're either going to add something to it because of what your training says you're going to do or what you've shared with me that day or that week, or we're going to keep it the same because I've found a lot of benefit in when athletes have to train in a, and this is figurative, because keep in mind how big my individuals are and how, many, how much they're eating anyway, mm -hmm. but when they have to train in a deficit. So, <laughs> yeah. So making that individual train, if you've got body fat on you, you've got a fuel resource you can tap <laughs> into. You just might not be very good at doing it. And so part of the diet process is in making the body more sensitive to being able to tap into body fat as a, another backup fuel reserve. You always want carbohydrates coming in from, in my world, coming in from the meal prior. But being able to train that body to be a little bit better at using stored body fat for fuel because again, your diet over the course of a day as a whole, you're not in a deficit and you don't necessarily need as much extra carbohydrates as you think you do in most cases prior to that training. So if you take that client and you get them kind of used to that pattern and that niche and being good at their skill of dieting, when you start to drop in the targeted cheat meals because they're getting into the, the thick of the block, that's when you're able to really elicit some big responses because the body had been used to being in a deficit, mm -hmm. meaning there just hadn't been anything extra there and it had to utilize itself. So when you let it have that extra stuff to play with, there's that stimulatory kind of impact and, and you get a typically a longer, more sustained energy output and strength. Now, post-training. Post-training is tends to be, I'm not big on like, uh, okay, well, you just trained. So it's got, post-training will typically be Whatever their regular diet meal is in their day, it's not anything added in additional typically. If they've done something like a big deadlift day, a big log day, or an event day, it's strongman. I'll typically put it in at dinner 
but not, let's say they trained at two. I won't make it that meal that follows first. Going back to that cortisol impact, the stress of the body, giving the body time to adapt, but also knowing that the majority of recovery is actually going to occur overnight. So why don't I give them the most of their available materials to repair itself overnight during that process when the body's already primed to do so? So in my world, that's the logic I use on that. All right, I'm going to take another bathroom break again because I'm going to explode. Then I want to talk about <laughs> um, you bringing Eddie Hall down for the boxing Oh, yes. Match. <clears throat> I want to let you guys know that we just had a limited edition drop on the website last week of new items that sweatshirt, flannel, t-shirts, shorts, basically the limited edition items are the items that directly support the Table Talk podcast. So if you go to EliteFTS.com backslash limited edition, or actually just the link in the description, you can find the limited edition items that we have now, which there's the one that I like the best is the shit suck good great, which is all emojis. The designs I always like the best, right? They're the ones that don't sell for shit, you know, but they're the ones that I want to wear that I like the best. And there's the, there's the cigar one as well and they're all there on the screen for you guys to be able to see. So if you go to EliteFTS.com backslash limited edition, the other thing that directly helps support the podcast that I haven't talked that much about is the Table Talk crew. The Table Talk crew is extra edition episodes that go out once a month. The content of those episodes are AMA related, quest related that come from the Table Talk Discord group, which is also part of being in the crew. When you're in the crew, there's dozens of ebooks that are in there. There's every seminar that we've ever done is put on there. There's courses that are put on there. There's series that have put on there. The original YouTube channel that we had for many years that we before we migrated to the newer one, all that old content is on there. There's discussion groups for just general training, fitness, life, nutrition, basically everything that you can think of is on. So just go look at what that is, or better than that, just go to the description, click on join the crew that helps directly support the podcast, which is how we're able to keep this thing rolling. Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate, and we are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. I want to let you guys know that we just had a limited edition drop on the website last week of new items that sweatshirt, flannel, t-shirts, shorts, Basically, the limited edition items are the items that directly support the Table Talk podcast. So if you go to EliteFTS.com backslash limited edition, or actually just the link in the description, you can find the limited edition items that we have now, which there's the one that I like the best is the shit suck good great, which is all emojis. The designs I always like the best, right? They're the ones that don't sell for shit, you know, but they're the ones that I want to wear that I like the best. And there's the, there's the cigar one as well. And they're all there on the screen for you guys to be able to see. So if you go to EliteFTS.com backslash limited edition, the other thing that directly helps support the podcast that I haven't talked that much about is the Table Talk crew. The Table Talk crew is extra edition episodes that go out once a month. The content of those episodes are AMA related, quest related that come from the Table Talk 
Discord group, which is also part of being in the crew. When you're in the crew, there's dozens of eBooks that are in there. There's every seminar that we've ever done is put on there. There's courses that are put on there. There's series that have put on there. The original YouTube channel that we had for many years that we, before we migrated to the newer one, all that old content is on there. There's discussion groups for just general training, fitness, life, nutrition, basically everything that you can think of is on. So just go look at what that is, or better than that, just go to the description, click on join the crew that helps directly support the podcast, which is how we're able to keep this thing rolling. Okay, we're back. That was, we were talking about like rehydration and all this stuff. It was just killing me. <laughs> <laughs> about to bust. Yeah, yeah. Well, it made me when it made me have to bust. It was crazy because I didn't have to pee until we started talking about <laughs> dehydration. But then all of a sudden, I had to pee really bad, and it just kept getting worse, which is kind of funny. <laughs> the um, you worked with Eddie Hall mm -hmm. when he was cutting for the boxing and through the training of the boxing mm -hmm. too. So, how did that come to be? And then, what was the process like? Um, Eddie contacted me and I'm, I'm pretty sure it was through his friendship with Brian. Um, and he's, I've been around Eddie for several years at the different events and stuff like that. So we've chatted and done different stuff. But, uh, so he contacted me. He's like, Hey, he's like, I want to do a boxing match. He's like, can you get the weight off? I want to be X amount. And he had a, he had a solid number in his mind that he wanted to be, uh, to get down to in order to what he felt like would sustain his strength as well as allow him to have the stamina that he needs and, and to be able to even train to do this. Yeah. Um, and so we kind of started from that. I was like, absolutely. And, and even, even in Eddie's book, he, he's got a, a big chapter in there and he's got examples of his diet that we did and stuff like that f for the boxing match. And it was so, it was so amazing on my part because it was one of the most fun experiences that I've ever had in working with an individual because it was so fucking complicated <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because I, I've, you know, it's one thing when I'm like, I talked about a contest, you know, and I've got to sit there and make a determination. Am I going to, do I need to prioritize fueling or recovery for a client, a strong man, or sometimes both, whatever the case may be in this situation, the priorities are, are multiple and they're daily because of how intense when Eddie does something, he's all in. And because of how intense he had everything regimented for himself and, and when I say he's all in, I mean, it is no days off. It is, it is 100% that is what it's about, and that will be what it's about until the finish line. And so he immediately attacked, you know, his, his stamina, his cardio, his recovery. And we're talking about just from an, from a, an endurance standpoint. Yeah. Then he's also learning how to box as a, as a professional boxer would box. So he had his boxing coach. So he's strength training constantly because he's Eddie Hall and he's extremely strong and he wants to yeah. always be extremely strong. He's doing his cardio and his endurance type training as well every day because he knows he's got to get up onto that. He's got his boxing going on. He's got his recovery stuff, which tends to be more, more, more endurance and cardio type things. We've got swimming going on because it's part of his, part of his hybrid cardio recovery type of thing going on. I got all these things going at once, daily, every single week, week in, week out, and I'm trying to get weight off of an individual. So Eddie carries an un unbelievable amount of muscle. Like he, you talk about genetically gifted individual, his muscle mass that he carries is unbelievable. And he holds it incredibly well because... As I was going into this, you know, I designed the diet with, with again, everything with me is lifestyle. It is not like, oh, look, that's not the most scientific way to do a diet. You're right. It's not. I do shit based on somebody's lifestyle and I got to make it work. Mm -hmm. That's, that's where I'm coming from. I'm not coming from perfection in science. I'm coming from it in the lifestyle, because if it was perfection in science, they're only going to be able to do 65% of it anyway. <laughs> so I kind of come at it like that. And I'm able to still dial him in using just unbelievable amounts of, of both meals and timing of things in order to get all his different agendas handled every single day, every single week, every single month. 
And along that process, we for about a year and a half, because he also tore his biceps sparring. And so then I had to handle his fuel needs, his cardio needs, his weight training needs, his boxing needs, his recovery need, and now his post-surgical bicep recovery needs. And then those alterations that that had on his training and his cardio mm -hmm. and his recovery systems. So it was constantly always in motion. And it was just absolutely fascinating to me to be able to watch as I would adjust one thing based on his feedback. And inevitably, because the human body wants to be like dominoes, it wants everything in a system. And if you shift something, it wants to shift something else. So using that kind of a system with Ed in order to constantly maneuver the cardio, the swimming, all these things, as he would say, hey, when I did the swim, I was gassed by about halfway. Okay, now I got to assess that. And I, how was weight training earlier that day? Oh, that went fine. Crushed it. Overhead was awesome. How was the boxing sparring? Uh, that went good. That went good. Yeah, we went X amount of rounds, and he brought in this guy to fight with him. Okay, excellent. What about, uh, you know, uh, cardio and dirt? Yeah, I went for a uh, five-mile run. Okay, okay. And so then we gassed it by the time we hit the swimming thing. So I have to look at all these different things and try to figure out, well, something has to give, right? Because, again, the body's like dominoes. Mm -hmm. So if I go and I address this swim thing, it's either A, now the weight loss part is going to stall or stop, or it's going to come back and it's going to overly affect something in the middle of all these other things that he does. Because in order to pull off so many goals all occurring simultaneously like that, his sensitivity has to be unbelievably high, meaning if I nail it, the results are going to be awesome. And if I blow it, it's going to be absolutely hugely something that he can't even ignore because like the swim thing, he's going to gas. It's not going to be like some subtle, oh, I got a little tired towards, oh no, it's going to be yeah. done because I don't have any margin for error because I'm also taking weight off of somebody. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. I don't have anything to play with here. So it, it was constantly um, Eddie giving me his feedback on here's what I noticed, here's what I need to adjust. Um, I think that I can do this with the cardio and I can probably move my boxing up to this part. What do you think we do with the diet on that? And at that point, it's going ahead and moving the diet to reflect what he's telling me on his feedback. Now, sometimes you end up with a situation where because I'm now addressing the boxing because the stamina started to slip there. But now the swim part's fine. No problem being gassed at that. So it's always moving something around and having Eddie, who, again, because he's so methodical, working on his skill of dieting, and listening to his cues on himself because he's so methodical and so consistent. He's able to tell me I did this, which was a little different. And I noticed that well, he, which he would notice an, another individual would probably never take note of what he noticed in that situation. It might've been something that was smaller. They just couldn't even really notice it because they've been too all over the place with things. Maybe it was this, maybe it was that, you know, who knows? were there consistency consistency is with which things felt off. Like was the swimming, the thing that felt off the most, or was it all over the map? No, it, well, it eventually, just as I was trying to kind of really dial them in, it was, it wasn't any one thing. It would annoyingly hop around. It might be swim and then it might be run. And then it might be the weight train a little, might be the recovery lags a little. And that's the one I was really trying to keep an eye on because, and especially once he had the surgery, because I'm trying to help facilitate through an additional surplus of macros, make sure that all the materials are available for recovery, but at the same time, not put weight on him. So is this constant back and forth of a, re, you know, for every action, there was a reaction, but Eddie, because he's so diligent, everything just immediately falls in line and so when eddie's doing what eddie does i can nail the boxing i can nail the weight training i can nail the swimming i can nail the running i can nail the sparring i can every single thing lines up because he's so methodical in what he's telling me so i'll drop in like mid middle of the week he might get a cheat meal just to make sure that things aren't like and i'm not even necessarily putting it in because like oh you can you know calorically or your metabolism can handle it we can get away with it that wasn't my focus as we're pulling weight off, it was, I'm still making sure that I can kind of see under the hood what your metabolism is doing, but more from a standpoint of how it's shifting around 
the macros and nutrients and handling that. You know, if that starts to slow down, so does that. I mean, when things move fast, everything moves fast. When things move slow, everything moves slow. If you have a slow metabolism, you tend to have a slow recovery. If you have a fast metabolism, you tend to have a fast recovery if you have the right materials present to do so. Was, was there a point? Because with what you're talking about, there's also a crash where you get the people, where everything's running fast. Mm -hmm. It's like a gift, mm -hmm. but you know you know what's coming. Yep. You know, did were you able to navigate well, the bicep tear would have been a crash, but forget mm -hmm. that, because that's a different type of crash. Mm -hmm. Were you able to, to mitigate that central nervous system dump like we were talked about earlier? Yes. And with that, I think that, honestly, the, the reason why that nervous system was able to not crash on him, and I mean, especially when you're talking about something like boxing where your adrenaline is really getting up, because I don't care if you're sparring or not, nobody likes getting smacked in the face. You know, so your yeah. adrenaline besides the uh, physicality of what the body is doing, there's the mental aspect of I'm getting pissed off because if you hit me in the face one more time, I'm going to about lose it. You know, so it's basically keeping all those things in motion and doing the little extras like the cheat meal that he would have there. Sometimes I would give him more protein in the mornings to start his day and more protein in the evenings to end his day for that reason too, trying to basically cover so that there's no lag on the recovery kind of as a start his day and to make sure that the fuel is there. I don't have to be as concerned about his fuel being excessive at the earlier part of his day when he has all those things stacked up that are like the boxing or the swimming or the car of the running and stuff like that, or even the weight training. It's being, it's making sure that when the extras come in, like we're swimming in the evening and stuff like that, that, when I handle that fuel source, that that's not where I overshoot it. And that's not where the body fat starts to sneak in. If he weighs in and he's like, Hey, I'm up two pounds. Well, the, the damage is different too, because you don't have the same type of spinal loading that you would have with mm -hmm. the strongman training or strength training, powerlifting type stuff, stuff. And you don't have the car crashing that we were talking about mm -hmm. there. So did that change the protein requirements that he needed? Or was that kind of the same just because of so much shit that was going on. No, his protein was definitely lower. Okay. Yeah, his protein was definitely lower than what it would normally have been if it, we were doing uh, strongman or if we would have been doing powerlifting, anything like that. So it was more like keeping that, ba that base in place so that there's enough there to handle kind of the recovery needs and so that he wasn't tearing himself down into making, again, trying to condition the body to primarily use stored body fat for fuel rather than breaking down muscle tissue for fuel. And that's where that, that feedback with the client is so critical because Eddie and what he's noticing in the weight training, I mean, if his muscle tissue is being broken down and as tuned in as he is when it comes to his weight training and what his strength levels are, that would have been the first thing that he would have mentioned. Hey, psh, I only hit this on that. What gives? So where are you, where are you, where are you <laughs> trying to get most of the energy needs from, from fats or the carbohydrates? Carbohydrates. Okay. Yeah, I needed them in and I needed them out. So that in the small downtime between all the events that would happen daily, his body was forced to go ahead and tap body fat yeah. for fuel during those times. <clears throat> okay, because I'm thinking long term, you know, the fats, because it's a long, it's a mm -hmm. long ass day. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. there's how long was between each but one of these? Keep things? in mind, he's having like seven to eight meals a day. All right, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so changes. he's having like seven, eight meals a day. It's basically like he's doing something and then we're eating, but we're eating not enormous amounts. Yes. But he's doing something he's eating. He's doing something he's eating. He's doing something he's eating. So basically, as it's going in, it's dialed in to where it's just enough to get the job done and then just enough following it to set up the next event to where there's just no give or take really for a surplus. Yeah. But we're, okay, I'm going to pivot here for a minute. There, actually, no, I'm going to go back to there. So fictitiously, let's just say there were only three meals per day. Then would have been more fats than it was carbohydrates. It depends because Eddie, Eddie is very carbohydrate sensitive. He will crash. Wow. So, yeah, Eddie is very carb sensitive. So I don't think so. I think it would still have been predominantly carbohydrate. So mm -hmm. he can handle them and handle them very well. And I think that's probably due to... You know, his background when he was young, you know, he's this incredible swimmer and stuff. So his body from a young age is used to to doing things of an extreme physicality for a long duration and having the fuel starts to do it. Because I'm sure when he was younger, you know, a teenager, he didn't know necessarily how to eat per se. 
And so he's here's that whole training in a quote unquote deficit mm -hmm. where that body was pulling off all his incredible swim feats, you know, that he was doing was young qualifying for Olympic level stuff from being able to pull that off in a deficit and efficiently using body fat, being sensitive to carbohydrates, stuff like that. With the top tier athletes that you have worked with, what what would you define as the common attributes amongst them? It can be mental, physical, technical, just it doesn't have to be the nutrition things. What are, because you have different personality types, no Ooh, doubt about that. So many. You know, so what would be the commonalities that you see? Commonalities, every, every single individual is an extremely driven individual and they're self-motivated. I don't, I don't have any that have to be, um, have to be poked and prodded either to follow a diet per se too much. I'm again, I work in the real world. So to me, poked and prodded is that if they dodge this or dodge that or replace this with that, I've kind of already accounted for that in the design of the lifestyle of their diet. It's more about being ahead of they're not going to necessarily have the uh, needing me to be like father them or lecture them on why this is important or that they're going to do it and they're going to do it well because they're a self-starter and they know that yes i know i need to do this so i'm going to do it you know sometimes begrudgingly but going that route but it's the same way they approach the training you know they're self-starters they're self-motivated um i would say that's probably the most common trait that all of them have Elaborate a little bit more on driven. When they wake up every day, that there are, they don't feel like they've had a day if they didn't accomplish something. It might be like Brian. It might be um, with his businesses. It might be something with his family. It might be in the gym with Tom or Luke Stoltman. Same thing. It might be businesses. It might be in the gym. Um, Trey Mitchell or Evan Singleton or Rob Kearney. Maxine Boudreau, all these individuals, if the thing I always see is if they wake up that day and they didn't address their training as they were supposed to, that's the one thing that I'll notice just is not something they'll tolerate. It's just not an option. They don't view training as an option. And typically it's because they know that if it's a training they blow off, their, comp their competitor is not. If it's a meal they blow off, their competitor is eating that same meal. You know, and it's that type of thing that I think really seems to separate individuals either when something was once a hobby and becomes a profession and just the switch clicks or individuals who are just kind of self-driven and just that's their gear. You know, like, was, was the quality there before they became top tier if, if you were working with them that long? Well, it's from a longevity standpoint, like Brian goes back to 2011. Yeah. And from the from the first day I had contact with him with a diet, that it is all go, all now. I will be the very best. And nobody can chain me down, hold me down, stop me, beat me, nothing. It's going to happen. And it's almost like you're from another planet if you were to be like, well, but what if uh, like this were to happen? He'd be, he'd just... It's not an option. That type of individual, I will win. I will succeed. I will be the best. Because he, he can't see. There is no alternative. That's, it's like always kidding. I always call him Michael Jordan a strongman because, yeah. A, not to mention what he's done for the sport and helped all the guys with the exposure and the attention and the improvements and, and the way the whole sport in general has grown so much. But that mindset is just unbelievable. And Jordan, that's Michael, has the same exact type of mindset where it's like you're speaking a foreign language. If you, What do you think if you miss that shot? It never entered his mind. I might miss that. Like yeah. with Brian, it's never entered his mind. He might miss a lift. Lifts will be missed. It's human nature. But it's as much a surprise to him as it is anything else. And guess what? It's not an acceptable surprise either. You better believe he'll hit it the next time. Well, I think what people miss with that mindset that you're talking about is they they don't see that that unwavering is for long periods, long, long periods, long, you periods. know, where people will from from my experience, some people will pretend 
to have that and can have that and run it really well mm -hmm. for six or eight weeks mm -hmm. where it's different, you know, for those that are running it for six to eight years, you know, and that's, that's the separator. Cause it's, there's, there's people that, for me, there's people that trick you. Like you think, you know, it, but I've been around long enough. Like, ah, there's something just not, not there, mm -hmm. it, but you think, mm -hmm. and then it's like, ah, oh, fuck three months later. No, it's, then there's other ones, mm -hmm. you know, that, that time, you know, so it's, that's, I guess what I'm asking here is with those guys, it's, it's unwavering for long times, long periods of time. I mean, even the time <laughs> off is planned time off, 100%. which is still waking up, thinking about what they're supposed to do. Absolutely. And, and a lot of things take the back burner and have to hold because that is the priority. There's that mindset. Like if you're chasing to, to be the best in any sport or, or any profession, you know, whatever it may be, it could be a model, you know, if, if your pursuit of being the very best at that is all encompassing, I think that's the one thing that, that can't be faked. You know, I think that it, like you said, I think you can spot it and I think it flushes itself out. Oh, it does. You know, you know, cause you can see, and it's, and it's also pretty easy to tell because the, usually the people who are faking it are just bigger assholes about it. Mm -hmm. Right. Because over a period of time, you get humbled a lot. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like, here's what it, and the other part that makes this mindset so intriguing to me is success isn't guaranteed, but the mindset still stays. Yes. You know, and that's, that's the part people have a tough time. Well, with. it's like, I always say, and even with the diets, I always say, if not today, tomorrow. And, and a lot of times you'll see that backwards. Like you'll see, you know, uh, you, you said tomorrow, today, or whatever, you know, with like people starting a diet. I, I disagree. I, and that's a very defeatist kind of an attitude in that, yes, people do put things off, whatever. But from a champion mindset, the champions, if not today, it's tomorrow. It, it's not a matter of if, when, but. No, no, no. If not today, tomorrow. It's that unwavering mm -hmm. bam. Yeah. Period. What do I need to do now? Yes. Right. It's immediate. That's what I've seen. It's it's the immediate action. You know, if if there if there's a goal or an objective that you want to achieve, then you take action today, a little one, just to fucking get started. Right. right? Where so many won't. Like, oh, I just put it. I'll just I'll, I'll start that next week. Mm -hmm. Good luck, fucker. You ain't ever gonna start it. Right. You know, better for the other ones. Mm -hmm. You know, and it kind of goes that full circle with that where are there any other ones outside of that just because that's that's huge mm -hmm. but then after that mm -hmm. is there any other things that stick out no fear of repetition <laughs> there's that's a good one there's no fear of repetition the training might be the same as far as how they go about it or how they broach it or their time of day their food that they select might be the same day, day out, um, when they sleep, every aspect of that, but they have no fear of repetition. It's not, I've never once heard someone say, I'm bored eating this, or I'm bored training this, or I don't want this. And their reason being, because it's what I always do. There's no fear of repetition. They see the value in repetition. That's the difference. Those that flush themselves out or they're only going to do it for a little while, the repetition, they have an allergy to it or something. They fear repetition. The champions, they embrace it. Bring it on. Fucking let me do this day in and day out because it's what it's going to take for me to be the very best there is. And that's all I care about. I don't care I'm eating the same thing today. I don't care that I'm doing the squats the same way that I did as far as within my block. You know, they've got variations. Yeah. But... They don't fear repetition. They embrace it because they know that ultimately it's like anything. You get better through repetition, better through the repetition of your diet, better through the repetition of your sets, better through the repetition of, of your form as you perform your sets and your different events and lifts. They don't, they don't fear it or get bored by it or stagnant. They embrace it and, and they relish it. Are there any other attributes that come to mind? Hmm. I don't know because at the top level, I see so many of, of those same characteristics. 
and this is going to be a ridiculous one to throw out there, but at the top level, and especially amongst strongman and my, my powerlifting clients, male, female, male, female, strongman as well, damn, everybody's got a real good sense of humor. Nobody takes themselves too seriously, even if they're all business. If their training is all business, the diet is all business, everything is focused, they still, every single one of them has an incredible sense of humor and is able to help their fellow competitor, you know, guide them. It's very unselfish, you know, which you saw a lot of that, like at Westside. It's that mm -hmm. same kind of thing. Like you guys are a collective and you're working together. You sure as shit want to beat, you know. Oh, yeah. But you also want to be better in the process and you want him to be better because when he's better, it's going to push you more. And that's what you actually want. So it's kind of like dual adjust. Dual well, it was also kind of like a rare breed, you know, where you, you try to find like minded people. Mm hmm. And they're hard to find. And then mm -hmm. you find them. And you're like, oh, this is great. These are like my people. Yes. You know, like the rest of the world don't it's fit. your clan. Like you don't fit in the rest of the world. So it's like my people. I can right. fuck around, have fun, joke mm -hmm. around. So it's, it's at least that's how I've always kind of felt. It's like, oh, fuck. Now I got to go back to the real world. Mm -hmm. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You know, let's get back to the other stuff. Were there, um, were there any topics that I didn't bring up that you wanted to discuss? Ah. Uh. I got a little bit about kind of just mindset, if you will. You know, sure. I, the Duke part of my education, if you will, is, you know, like. Um, health and wellness coaching, and that's because I, w I wanted to be able to better myself and provide another extended view for the information that my clients are telling me. Because again, in my world, I function building everything off the lifestyle. Well, it, it occurred to me that, you know what, maybe I need to have a broader, greater understanding of what it's like in that lifestyle so that I can, as best I can, put myself in that individual's shoes and kind of have a different view to help them be able to come up with alternative options, solutions, and things like that with whatever they may have going on. Because I don't feel it's very beneficial, for, especially from a dieting perspective, for me to tell an individual, well, you said you missed breakfast because uh, you had to leave work that day and so you didn't, and so you didn't have it and you just went out the house. So what I'm going to want you to do is have your breakfast. Like I don't, me telling you what to do, I feel is a, is, is a disservice. I think I needed to learn how to work with individuals in order to collectively find a solution that is beneficial for the two of us. So a solution that works for you within your lifestyle and gets you thinking about, well, perhaps I could do this or this or that and running by things off of me and I kind of empower you with either another view expanding on what you've shared with me or uh, perhaps just opening yourself to a couple of other ideas. But I'm not telling you as the diet client or the nutrition client or the contest prep client, however you want to look at it, this is what you need to do. This is the solution because I don't think that's viable. I think you, and it needs to be just like part of your lifestyle is your mental view of your lifestyle. How you view yourself and your lifestyle might be incredibly complicated. And I have no time for anything. And it's as you said, often individuals actually have more time than they think they do, or they actually have more availability or access to things that they realize than they fail to realize. And so, but people also don't like to be told what to do. You know, the first thing we do, it's like, goes back to, I guess, being teenagers. Mom, dad tells you to clean your room. Yeah. We ain't doing it. But if we wake up in the morning and notice that our room looks like shit and we got a friend coming over, we clean it. It's that same sort of a thing. And so I wanted to be able to incorporate that with clients and, and help them understand that the mental aspect of dieting and within their lifestyle and how they approach their overall game plan is as much important as their ability to, to hit it 100%. If you run into a challenge that day, it's like with the honey oat granola bars or whatever, and you know you're going to miss that meal and the solution is either, well, you're going to have to miss it. That's a terrible solution. Or grab that RTD from the gas station to pack your granola bars and, and cut your losses, so to speak. But empowering you to make that decision kind of gets ingrained 
and it's no longer something that you kind of fear or do the, oh, shit, now what? You, you feel empowered, you feel in control, and you can make that decision. And you find yourself repeatedly making similar good decisions like that as they pertain to within your lifestyle. Because again, every time something comes up and you're training for a contest, but yet your wife has this situation or your brother had this come up and you had to run out there and, uh, you know, get the boat out of the lake for him, you know, I don't know, whatever the case may be. You need to still be empowered that I'm going to do this and it's great. You know, you're not adding more stress to yourself. You're not anything. You've got an alternative plan and you're empowered to make that because too often from the mental aspect side of things, people beat themselves down, stop themselves far short from what they could achieve and basically don't understand that even if you're at the local level and you're a you're power lifter and you're in your 242 weight class and you compete in your class and let's say you you know you're fourth whatever it is it, it didn't hit the goal that you wanted to hit but you're still fourth people need to be able to step back and analyze themselves for the moment at least on what they truly achieved and that is that mentally they need to be able to find happiness and success in that fourth and not disregard it and piss because it wasn't first and again i'm talking about the top of the elite where there's a lot of money at stake and there's there's things that's a little bit of a different perspective and there's other ways of looking at that but for these other individuals you're still stronger than like 90 percent of the world so you might be fourth in your local powerlifting contest in your weight group but you're still stronger than probably everybody that you work with at the office or that you went to school with or whatever in the big scheme of things. And the more you're able to celebrate those types of victories, the more you'll find yourself able to sustain moving forward on whatever journey it is, because you won't just get discouraged. You're not compared. Don't be, you know, out there three weeks into your strongman journey and trying to compare yourself with Trey Mitchell on a log press. You know, or don't be out there trying to be, you know, what Tom can do, picking up a stone. Celebrate the fact that you picked up the 100-pound stone for the first time or celebrate the fact that you did an unloaded log, which that's still heavy. But take notice of what you're achieving and how you're achieving it and embrace it and continue to go down that road rather than just what I see over and over again. And like you, like you said, where people will just start and they'll flush themselves out. And it's either through lack of effort, but most often I think it's through unrealistic comparisons. That yes, it's it's perspective as well, and perspective's kind of a two-way street. So if the other night we were having dinner, it was my son's birthday, and um, this is twenty-first birthday, so he's oh, all awesome. excited to have his fucking drink that. and shit like That's that. That's great. So anyhow, it's you know it's on the spectrum and there was a kid over there that was crying, you know, a baby, you know, a baby drives him crazy, you know, so I'm jokingly with him. I'm like, you know, when you were little, man, you were way worse, dude. <laughs> it was unbelievable. I mean, you would just fucking, and he did. He went mm -hmm. on and throw fits for hours and just, and he cracked, he, he laughed, you know, it was funny for a minute and mm -hmm. it kind of diffused for a second. And then, you know, he, he went out and he came back and started talking a little bit again. And I, I said something again and he said, look, just stop. Right. And I'm, then I, at that moment, I thought, okay, now, and I, I become better at doing this as I've gotten older. Like, okay, what perspectives am I missing here? Let me run this yes. situation through three completely different perspectives I'm not thinking about. Then it hit me like, oh, he feels guilty that he made us years ago have to walk out of the restaurant because he was throwing a fit for two hours. Mm -hmm you know, different perspective, mm -hmm. you know? And so then it changed that situation to where I've seen, you know, I've seen, I've had conversations with friends of mine that have kids and they're like, you know, they're trying to explain to their kids, look, we work so hard because we want to give you more. So we're, you know, like not there as much as what we should be. And then it's different perspective. You know, are you making that kid feel guilty now because you have to do this extra work right. where you're trying to actually make them feel you know, empowered because this is what you're doing to give them a better life. Mm -hmm. But what, you see what I'm saying? Can you Absolutely. take that perspective of whatever that is and flip it on its head and just think, mm -hmm. you know, because sometimes that increases the ability to communicate your point and um, you may completely be missing a point, you know? So for mm -hmm. some of these clients where we may be thinking, oh, they just don't have it. 
uh, maybe they think right. we think Correct. they don't have it. And because we've been around so much, mm -hmm. they don't want to waste their time because we've already seen so many people go through mm -hmm. and maybe we can detect it beforehand and they would just rather put their time on something that they really could be successful at. Mm -hmm. You know, flipping the same thing, which fucks with your head a little bit. Tremendously. You know, but I think that's important. You know, it's important to consider and important for both sides of a conversation mm -hmm. to be able to consider that. Because actually it's, it'd be better if we all learned how to fucking mm -hmm. do that a little bit better, you know, because it puts different frameworks on things right. that may be set in a predetermined bias that shouldn't, shouldn't, or maybe it's there for a reason, maybe it's not, you know, but that shift in perspective is huge, you know, from a coaching standpoint and just from a communication business. I mean, all this stuff, you got to learn like, what the fuck is this? Mm -hmm. You know, the first answer usually isn't the right one. No, 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 no. <laughs> but that's the default for most people. Right. Right. Is that. And I think that with that may be something that with those higher end athletes or something that they realize as well, that that first answer usually isn't the right one. Mm -hmm. You know, because they've learned that impulse has been wrong a lot. Mm -hmm. Stop. No, it's good. No, it's going to happen. Like, no, this is my first reaction. Might not be the best answer. Right. Um, <clears throat> my question to you would be, when you're predominantly working remotely, mm -hmm. how do you bridge that gap? Through, you know, the, the communication that you have with that client and making sure that they know it's an open door, you know. So I'm big on following through, if you will, following plans, because it's not much need to contact me. Hey, I didn't follow the diet. Okay. We, we both know that. I know that because I see the results <laughs> and you know that because you see the results. So we both know that. So that doesn't move either one of us forward on overcoming this problem. So I'm big on when they do their, you know, their check-ins as far as either emails or texts giving me that feedback on what they hit, what they didn't hit their, their observations on like the sleeping and all that stuff. Yeah. That's all, that's all important. But the big thing is how is it that you plan on moving forward for the rest of the week or for the, for the weeks ahead? And what is it that I can do to overcome that obstacle for you? So if it's a lifestyle thing because of times or schedules or meal prep or foods or whatever, those are definitely the types of things that I need to know about so that I can facilitate a solution for that. There is no solution for me to facilitate, nor will I tell a grown human, stop skipping meals. You know, we both know that, and I'm not going to treat you like a child. I, but it kind of goes back with the Duke thing as far yeah. as I'm going to help you to find the solution. And if you tell me, and I think I need to batten down on the meals and stop skipping, it sounds like a great idea. You know, I'm going to help you to kind of come to that solution because the fact is we as we stick to things. I guess it's our egos. We stick to things that are our idea. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you help build it, you live in it, right? Absolutely. You own it. Yeah, you, you take own that it. ownership. And that's yeah. kind of something that I try to do. And it's still with all my clients is, is we all are taking ownership of this together. And that you understand that I've taken time out of um, facilitating other clients or whatever in order to get to this solution for you that you are taking ownership in and that you have told me is a viable solution on that. And the diet is built into your lifestyle. Again, it's like, we didn't, we didn't go the like Google build a diet or, I mean, Dave, there are so many individuals on this planet and in this, in this field that are, I mean, geniuses. I mean, there are the Elon Musks in this field um, when it comes to nutrition and training and stuff yourself. And, and so I know that that's not me, but I'm able to implement within a client's lifestyle and a system, something that, that can generate results that often, more often than not, can surpass what science says a human being should actually be able to do. And that's because I'm canceling out so much of, or taking into account so much of the human element. You know, that's like why I think it would be hard for AI 
to like generate diets in this field with top level athletes to produce the results that a fallible human like myself can produce. I think it can for those coaches that are not the best in their field. I think they can easily be replaced. Mm -hmm. But when you're dealing with the coaches who, when I say are best in their field, I'm talking the ones that are eliciting, that are getting the results. The way you get the results is by everything that we've talked about mm -hmm. so far today, mm -hmm. is that communication element, that dialogue, that back and forth. Um, yes, it's probably possible with AI, but you need to prompt the right questions and you have it, <laughs> you know, it's gonna, it's, it's, it's not, it, it, even with that, I'm still gonna say it's hard, it's gonna be very hard pressed but if those, and I guess this is a message for the coaches that are coming up, if they're not working their ass off to perfect their craft and perfect their communication skills and perfect their, uh, their ability to see the perspectives like we're talking about mm -hmm. here and all these different things, they are fucked. Mm -hmm. rightfully so, because everybody's been bitching about this for the last, <laughs> what, you've been around a while. Oh, I mean, I've yes. been bitching about this since it started. Yes. You know, so it's going to wipe that the fuck out mm -hmm. and actually produce better results. Right. But for the ones that are actually doing the work, maybe, maybe, this is a hope that I've always had, maybe it will thrust them to the point to where they can actually be compensated what they're worth, you know, which, you know, well, the market, you see what I'm saying? The, yes. Worth is determined. I, I need to step that back real quick. Work, the worth is determined by what the market's willing to pay, mm -hmm. right? So we got a fucked up online training industry because there's a, a very large market of service that's very hard to determine, good from great, right? That's diluted mm -hmm. on rate substantially, which makes it very hard for the very good ones to actually charge what they would if you were to sit down and have a consulting session with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that should be the rate. If you took that compounded by once a week, every week for 12 weeks, that would be what you would say a fair rate is, but that's not the market rate, mm -hmm. right? The market rate's far less, where now if that can be, you know, eliminated, yeah. you know, because now this is five bucks a month or whatever it's gonna be, mm -hmm. then that should be able to go up to where the value is higher, mm -hmm. right? So it's just, it's a weird market, it's changing. Yep. And um, I'm no, I'm not in a market, you know, I've just been this person on the outside looking into that market for so long and it's frustrating because there's people that do know their shit, like what you were talking, yes. really, really know their shit. And our standout, and it's frustrating when you know, like, what would you charge even going way back to when you were working at life, whatever with mm -hmm. the fucking LA white less, LA white less right? Mm -hmm. That here's the rate that it would have been for an hour, 20 some years ago. You couldn't even charge that now, mm -hmm. right? For as often as you're working with that person, that's mm -hmm. fucked up, yep. but it's, it's a different dynamic. Well, and with those, with the incredibly intelligent individuals, and I mean, we're talking research pay, we're talking everything. I mean, incredibly intelligent individuals who I admire to the fullest extent. One thing that I've noticed is interesting, and you you, you were talking about like what can coaches coming up kind of kind of grab and take some stuff. I don't know how many times I have had an individual ask me like, hey, you know, like either can I mentor them or can I... Um, you know, how do you, how do you, how did you end up, you know, how do you, how can I get th these types of clients or these clients or whatever? And it's like, the first result is the first question is, is, is a silly, stupid answer. And it's like, well, results, you know, if, if I didn't have the results yeah. for 15, 20 years, I wouldn't be sitting here with you, you know, and I owe all my clients and for the hard work that they did and producing the results that they did in order for me allowing to be here, or I would not be here. Um, so that's number one is the, is and, it, and they think that you got to like grab some superstar person in order to like start your coaching. It's like, no, man, you, you got to make a superstar. Like my guys, none of them had won. Like if you just look at strongman, none of them had won the world's strongest man title until we were working together. So it, it wasn't a situation where somebody had won world's strongest man. And then I began to coach them. 
I don't know what my contribution is. I'm sure it still would be significant because a contribution is always significant. But it's like you, but they weren't the superstar technically that they either now are or went on to become or whatever the case may be. It's like collectively we had a goal. My goal automatically by default is my client's goal. And, and that goal was worked at extremely hard by the client and, and we, we reached that goal, but they weren't a superstar from the get with. I didn't know what Ryan was going to do, you know, to win his pro card or, or Alan or, or Travis or Johnny was winning his pro card and stuff like that. It, these were individuals who they had a goal. We collectively worked together and things were achieved. And that's how you get more clients. You have to take someone and you got to push them to something. You got to help be part of their journey that gets them to where they want to go. And that's how you get clients because then somebody else saw as you were part of this person's journey. They got to where they wanted to go. Here's my journey. Let me tell you about it. Can you get me there? And, and that, I don't know how many times I'll ask a client, I'll ask a, a, a younger coach, or sometimes it's a much more experienced coach even, and they're trying to kind of grasp the different ways that I go about the strength stuff and why my people achieve this. And, you know, we all like to, to talk and, and help each other and maybe why his client at that particular um, contest didn't come through with what he anticipated. And did I have any, you know, thoughts? And Dave, I shit you not, for a hundred times that I've asked the question, well, walk me through a day in his life. I've never once had anybody answer it. Not once. Doesn't matter if it's a pro athlete, if it's an amateur athlete, I've never had a diet coach who looked me in the eyes and could tell me, okay, well, so he typically gets up at five and then he goes out, you know, does this, does that, you know, he's got a wife, he's got three kids. Now I know the one kid's in Southway. They can't tell me anything about a day in the life of their client. And it's like, that's, that's step one. And I understand it's because I view things differently. And I understand that I make my systems all about that client's No, lifestyle. but you, you see why I say those people are easily repelled by go. AI. And there you go. hundred percent. Right? Because, because of that, you know, 100%. and those are the ones that got to watch. The other thing with, you know, if, if, if you have a coach that's worked with known athlete, there's hundreds, if not thousands of athletes that are not known. Yes. That that coach has worked with too. Yes. Where the people that. Myself included. Yeah, exactly. So those people that, are, you know, are thriving to work with known athlete are forgetting the fact that there were hundreds or thousands, you know, that got worked with too. They just want the known athletes. Mm -hmm. And e even with, there's, there's only so many, right? So if I, if we were to sit here and say, tell me all your clients, right? Not all of them are the greatest fucking athletes in the world. I mean, probably the majority aren't, you know, and that's the nature where I think a lot of people has this false perception that I only want to work right. with the best. Well, yes. first off, you're an idiot because you don't. Right. Like if you did, you would know why mm -hmm. you don't want right. to only have them. Mm -hmm. clients. 100%. You know, it's, like, it's a mm -hmm. different fucking world, mm -hmm. um, but it's a, it's a false uh, reality. Well, and I embrace it because I'm always, I always feel as a coach that I'm able to take, you know, I do so much work with diabetics and like when I do seminars and stuff, some of the seminars are strength and strongman and stuff like that. A lot of the seminars focus solely on diabetes and diabetics in a general population setting and helping them to, to go about things in a very different manner as far as controlling how they're treating their diabetes. But you look at how many times an individual might an individual might want to hire a coach, be a coach, um, change coaches. But the motivation is never clear on any of those as far as why that is the decision they're making. You know, as much as an in, I've, I've had too many situations where nobody could ever tell me a day in the life of their client. I have similar things when I'll hear why. And it might be when somebody comes to me, like I'll have a regular um individual who has their own goals, whatever that may be. It may be, um, you know, a high level lawyer at Phillips 66, who's a good friend of mine. Um, it may be, um, you know, a doctor, maybe that housewife, like you mentioned, everybody's goal is equally as important as that pro athlete's goal to them. Mm -hmm. Okay. It has never failed me that I can 
be working with uh, my clients, let's say, at the, at the Arnold or something like that. And uh, like, let's say I'm working with Luke Stoltman. It has never failed me that I have not had an experience with the housewife in Iowa who encountered some sort of a challenge or some sort of a hiccup within the frame of her diet that was something that was a new experience to me, either the way her results didn't happen the way I thought they would, or sometimes the way she far exceeded where I thought she might be. It's never failed where I haven't learned a valuable lesson from that individual that I can take over to the pro athlete, a Luke Stoltman or, or whomever, and say, hey, you know, I want to try this. And it's because working with everybody and all these individuals with all their goals and treating them all alike and and zeroing in on the lifestyle so much never fails to be a tool that that inevitably solves a problem for one of the other because it is so so lifestyle based you know and and or you know diet experience and stuff like that and different foods but it never fails that i as a coach don't learn a takeaway from one person and and am able to apply it to another in its own individual manner, because again, no pe two people are ever going to respond to anything the same way. No, twice. that's a good point, though, because it's while different objectives, the uh, the objectives kind of the same. You know, while different, uh, man, what's the word I'm looking for? Backgrounds. Mm -hmm. You know, different backgrounds. The objective's still the same, <laughs> and it, it provides, like I was saying earlier, a little different perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're they're all human. You know, so they all have human thoughts, right? You know, so it's, so it, it makes sense, you know, and as, as I as we started having that, as I pointed out, having that different perspective coming in, you know, puts you in a place to be at a different level than other people that didn't have that perspective. So when you have the appetite perspective looking into something, it's a completely different view. Oh, absolutely. And, and I'm in this strange paradox because of all the individuals who, who I consider either my peers or who are involved in this industry and who are scientists and have PhDs and who I admire and, and, and try to learn and just find different viewpoints. I think that's the biggest thing for me. I don't necessarily know that I find like this new th thing to take or this new thing to eat. I think I find continuously new perspectives on either a challenge or or a new avenue that I haven't ever viewed as such. Now, I more often than not probably lack the ability to facilitate it in the manner of that PhD, but it has enabled me to consider, huh, now that in my world, in the context of lifestyles and stuff like that, could be applicable if I perhaps utilized it in this manner or that manner. And so those are things that I try to use and and expand my own abilities. And that has been massively highlighted by my you know, my daughter. I've got I've got two daughters. Uh, I've got a little little just turned 14 year old second. And I've got my daughter Saxby, who's 26. She'll be 27 in December. And Saxby just she's a registered dietitian. She's newly newly registered. So she's an RD. So she's a I call her instead of MD. She's RD. She's a food mm -hmm. doctor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I tell anyone and everyone loudly to the top of my lungs, you know, that that my daughter far outranks me on paper. My daughter is far smarter than me in reality. <laughs> she far outranks me on paper and she has uh, she has achieved things that just are incredible when it comes to. She has seen her dad. She's been around. She's gone to these events with me. She's met all the guys. She has pictures with everybody, you know, especially, uh, you know, be it NFL or be it the, the pro strongman guys, especially. And so she's she's seen me when I'm writing diets. She's heard me conversing with my clients when I'm either trying to problem solve something or she's seen me go down the rabbit hole if I'm like stumped on something. And I'm like, I, I don't know the answer to this and I need to find the answer to this. Bottom line, I need to get better at this. And she has seen me go through that kind of sequence of events. And, uh, and it's fascinating because she sees how I do my diets. She knows how, as an RD, she does her nutritional programming, schooling, and education. And the things that she shares with me are incredible. You know, I mean, people are on life support and she's the one keeping them alive, you know, figuring out what the correct ratios are to tube feed and, and to do that. Just, it's incredible the things that she can do in emergency settings. 
And it blows my mind. I'm so incapable of anything like that. But she'll work with general population diets as well in it, and she'll come across a situation where she'd be like, I don't understand. The textbooks clearly say this. The science clearly says this. And I'm not getting that response with my, with my client. Dad, do you have any thoughts? And I'm, again, first thing I always say is, you're far smarter than me. You yeah. far outrank me. You're probably making a mistake asking me anything about this. <laughs> but um, I'll give her a perspective that tends to be either, well, what's a day in their life? She knows that question. What's a day in their life? Or, you know, what's the pushback? What is it that, that you're hearing as far as why that scenario is occurring? And she'll see me either offer a solution that is totally against what the textbooks say, but it works. And that goes back to how we started the interview where I talk about how I, I approach the body from a place of imperfection with diabetes because things are imperfect. It's not processing right. The textbooks are written from a perfect ideal scenario, like that manual I talked about at the beginning of the, of the day, you know, with the, the new vehicle. You know, it's supposed to go from point A to point B. Well, then why is, why is there a warranty on cars? Why is shit breaking? I don't understand. Same parts, same make, same model, same factory. Why are there even warranties? Like, why would anything ever go wrong? Ah. Hmm. There's, that, there's that human element, that environmental influence, and shit is going to go wrong because things just aren't perfect. And she'll be very surprised that something very simple or whatever solution when it's not what a textbook says should happen or it's not what the science says should occur, but it's what the human element says should occur, you know? And so there's always a little bit of science and a whole lot of human element and lifestyle that I have found ultimately can usually typically kind of solve some stuff yeah. if, if she's stuck like that, you know? And so it, it's just amazing be, for me to be able to see her perspective and to try to watch how she does things, even though it's far beyond my ability to understand, but to be in awe of, of as she's going about it and just, Jesus, really? But at the same time, watching something from a little podunk country boy get through and have a solution in the science world. It, it's just, it's, it's a fascinating um, paradox or whatever. No, it's interesting say. because you're going to have the both. Yes. Both and I get worlds. to see it play out in real life. Yeah. Um, you know, I have NFL teams. And, and, and by the way, if you're listening, NFL teams, I find it odd that nobody wants like a strength nutritionist when your whole sport and the people butts in the seats is about sports of performance that. You know, the whole world stars, man, strongest people on earth, highest muscular endurance on earth. I'm just saying. <laughs> it just seems weird that nobody's created that department amongst the team. Like, let's have a let's have a strength specialist, you know, some sort of special part. They have registered dietitians, mm -hmm. you know, don't get me wrong. And they're brilliant and they're awesome. But there is that next level component, as you know, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, but I'll have teams like I've worked with two or three different teams that have called me and, and I've done consulting for them because they've had a problem that did not flush out with what was supposed to happen when they addressed a particular need. Um, it's been uh, there's been diabetes needs with clients that were a surprise. And individuals have been signed um, and and just or just an individual um, not responding to things as they thought they might. And if I have a possible solution, because the book says and this is what we're doing, and we're following it to the letter, but we're not getting that response. And, and it, it just never fails to fascinate me how science is just constantly always something that is in motion. But the problem is that human being, science is always evolving and progressing, but the problem is that human being is also always in a state of motion. And sometimes it's in the right direction, sometimes mm -hmm. it's in the wrong direction, sometimes it's sideways. And it's, it's merging those worlds is where you seem to see, like, I think all these, what if you look over the last four or five years, these tremendous leaps in strength achievements, especially. And, and I think it's these merging of worlds. You know, I think we're all getting accepting of one another and, and taking bits and pieces of learning and, and implementing it with, and, and you're seeing things, I think, just take off. Oh, I believe so. I most definitely believe so. That it's it's <clears throat> the the mistakes of the past are not being repeated. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's a lot of factors at play there, but what you're talking about is definitely a big one in there. How would what's the best way people can get a hold of you? Um, uh, just shoot me an email. My website is nathanpayton.com. You can shoot me an email directly off of there, or my email is nathan at nathanpayton.com. Um, also Instagram uh, at probodycoach. 
on Instagram is one that you can uh, can certainly contact me and stuff like that. Uh, you know, and of course, and I'm just me. And so I always like to say that um, I'm, I'm the boring person behind the uh, behind the apron, if you will. And so it 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 would really make me happy if everyone who maybe has an interest in what I do really maybe hyper, maybe take up your attention and your focus a bit on those athletes that you know that I work with and that that's why uh, kind of you have an interest in me because they need your support. I need your support, too. Don't get me wrong. But my athletes, they're the ones that that are putting their neck on the line. I'm not out there. I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm building the race car. I'm building the best car that I can for them on that day. But they're the guys that have to drive it. They're the guys that are at risk in what they do. And it, bottom line, power lift, strength sports across the board. You got to have a set of nuts. <laughs> and that goes yeah. for my female clients. Mm -hmm. And that goes yeah. for my female listeners out there, too. You are a courageous SOB because anything can go wrong at any point in time, but you are so focused on the pursuit of betterment that, that that's the line you want to go. You want to be the best version of yourself that you can be. So I always say, man, focus on my clients. They're incredible. They're amazing. They do incredible feats of strength. They're real life superheroes across the board. And, uh, they will inspire you. If, if you're new to, to powerlifting, if you're new to strongman, if you're new to the NFL, is there such a thing or baseball or, or all these different things or music, you know? Um, but if you're new to any of those things, especially the strength sports, man, check, check out all these people and, and clients that I don't work with, but just check out these sports. If there's something you haven't looked into before, because there, there are human beings doing feats of strength in this day and age, you're, you're witnessing something that is truly incredible. And that I think your children will, will probably reference this time period in history, as far as like, do you remember? And during that chunk, things evolved at the pace that, that hadn't been seen before. And I'm not sure we'll be seen since. I mean, I don't think we're gonna see 1500 pounds on a guy's back. I don't think we're going to see, I worked with tiny Meeker. He was the first human being to pet, to break that 1100 plateau for an equipped lifter you know, 1102 bench and then 1125. And I thought that was mm -hmm. absurd and we're not going to do that. I didn't think it was going to pass, you know, Ryan or um, Scott's numbers, you know, with the thousands. But then Tiny hits the 1102, Tiny hits the 1125. It's like, and I always, Tiny always gets mad, but he laughs and he understands. I always say, dude, I don't give a shit if you press that bench. Because he's a equipment partner for mine in Metroflex Houston. So he's there, you know, mm -hmm, he's mm -hmm. my partner. And so I get to see him constantly you know, doing his thing. And I always tell him, I, say, I don't give a damn. He'll go, look, look at this video of me with 1300. Look at this video of me with 1400. And that's what he's doing. I'm probably not supposed to say that. But, mm -hmm. Oops, sorry, Tiny. Think you're talking. But that's what he's doing, you know, when he's in the gym working. And I always tell him, I don't give a shit about you pressing that. I said, I'm in awe at the moment of time that happens when you're holding that bar above your body <laughs> and there's not fuck all anything helping you. <laughs> that is where you have my undivided attention. And that is where hats off to you and <laughs> you're nuts, dude. I mean, you must have to bring them in with a wheelbarrow because that to me seems terrifying. Again, the press, it, it is yeah. a skill set. It is learned. It is very impressive, but holding mm -hmm. on the out, I, I just, it's unbelievable. So there's so many human beings out here in strength that are doing things that should, that, that have the potential to be so inspiring to anyone with their own unique goals. If you just take note and follow the individuals and, and just uh, really, really understand and look at what they're achieving. It's, it's unbelievable. I want to thank you for coming out. This has been a great time. Thank, um, you, thank you guys Appreciate for you listening and we're done. <laughs>